Hogwarts Legacy is a third-person action, narrative-driven RPG set within the Harry Potter universe. Now, I don't know about you, but I know nothing about this universe, so during this video, you may see me not understand some things, or I may get lost when it comes to narrative moments. If that is the case, please let me know in the comments below. Regardless, as you guys have seen all over the internet, this game has been blowing up. All over Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Twitch, and YouTube. So what I'm going to do here is go over literally everything in the game. The narrative, the combat and gameplay systems, the companion quest lines, and so forth. If you don't want to be spoiled, I suggest playing the game first and then coming back to this video, because I will be summarizing every major narrative event, and then afterwards I'll give my two cents on them. This may be a long video, so that's why I'll put timestamps in the description. This will also show up in the time bar below. But what can you expect when it comes to the structure of this video? First, I'm going to handle the main quest line, and during the middle of that, I will talk about combat and certain other gameplay elements that are within the game. Then before a certain narrative moment hits, I will go over every companion quest line. And keep in mind, certain companion quest lines overlap with the main narrative, so hopefully no one will get confused when I go over them. If you are confused, just let me know in the comments and I will clear things up. Also in this video, I won't go over traditional side quests because side quests are plentiful in this game and I don't want this video to be four to five hours long. If you want a separate video going over the side quest, just let me know and I'll get on it right away. Anyways, this intro has gone on long enough, so strap in for a long video, follow my Twitch, the link will be in the description, ready your wands, and let's dive straight into the video. Kicking off the story, we read a letter that states our acceptance to Hogwarts as a fifth year student. And after this, it brings us right into the character customization. And literally any head you pick will look somewhat the same. I tried not to care so much about having the character look like me. I instead opted for making a wizard version of Anakin Skywalker. After this character customization, we get introduced to a character named Professor Fig, an extremely important character to the overall narrative. Apparently, we have a second-hand wand that isn't ours, so one can assume later that we will eventually get our own. Soon, a man by the name of George Osric comes to greet us in Professor Fig. He is just our 19th century Uber driver. He isn't important at all in the story. We get into a carriage that is seemingly getting pulled by nothing and we fly off. But when we do so, an ominous figure comes out of the shadows. The dude will be one of our main antagonists. So here is when we get into the nitty gritty of the plot and the basis on which it stands. So during this part, there won't be much critiquing, mostly just a description of certain elements that are important. Professor Fig states that being a fifth year is extremely rare at Hogwarts, that really no one in the faculty has heard of such a thing, though there has been some before as we will see later. And soon after, we get shown a newspaper of a certain goblin character, Ranrock the main villain of the game. It is said that this man is starting yet another goblin rebellion, but people aren't sure if this is the case or not. It is the case. George then reveals that Professor Fig's wife is the person that has alerted him to Ranrock's plans. This adds an interesting element to the story. Was his wife working with him before? How did she pass away? He states later that she isn't alive, so... How did she relay that information to George? The questions are good ones to have in setting a story up to be interesting. 
All of the sudden, George hands Fig a container that holds a port key. George states that whatever is protecting the container is a very powerful magic. And keep in mind, this is the first introduction to ancient magic. And when our character holds this container, it glows blue, indicating that we have this ancient magic ability. And this causes the container to open, reveals the port key that is hidden inside. Then out of goddamn nowhere, a dragon just offs George and takes out half of the carriage. And since our character has seemingly witnessed death, we can see the beasts that are pulling the carriage. And let me just say, this intro is one of the best intros I have ever seen in a game. It got me excited. It got me hyped. It made me interested to see where everything is going to go. The only intros that rival this would have to be the new God of War games. Honestly, this may be better. I'm not sure yet. Regardless, this has Fig and our character falling, but when they both touch the port key, they are transported to a mysterious place. Here we have a cool scripted sequence learning how to heal. We learn how to look around. I know a lot of games do this, but we honestly don't need it. It needs to be a thing of the past. But as we walk around, we get to see the beautiful graphics of the game. It is simply amazing to witness all of this. The only downside would have to be the seagulls. <laughs> These guys are very low poly and just look odd. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I had my eyes glued to them for a while, which isn't a good thing. Anyways, Fig tells us that we are somewhere in Scotland, which is where Hogwarts is located. So we're relatively close to where we need to go. While walking, it is revealed to us that Professor Fig's wife, Miriam, has spent years trying to find evidence of ancient magic. So one could assume that she will be an important figure later in the game. It is also revealed that Hogwarts is built on the said ancient magic. That should give you some hint at what lies ahead in this game and what places you will visit. After walking for a, quite a time, we see a wall that seems reflective, as well as a portal that travels to the bank of Gringotts. When getting there, we meet a goblin. He states that he knows what we're here for, a certain door that is held within the bank. He takes a little train car and eventually we make our way to the special door. But our character notices that something is off. There was a goblin security guard that we had seen that had ancient magic surrounding him, but it was a different than the port key. The one thing that I don't like about this section and some sections after this is that there are points when your character walks at a snail's pace. I hate when games do this for no reason. Why can't we just walk normally? Pushing on the analog stick softly will let the character walk already, so why make it mandatory that we walk slow? Even slower than normal walking speed at that. It just makes no sense to me. I had the same issue with Red Dead 2 when you were inside the camp. I just don't see a reason to implement this in your game. But after we step inside the vault and it locks behind us, and we're forced to learn the Revelio spell. This spell is something you will use constantly throughout your time in the game. You will use this every minute when you're in the middle of exploring. It has heavy reliance, which I find not a good thing, though I will say that it doesn't bother me too much like it does to other YouTubers that expressed this displeasure. I just find it a minor nuisance, nothing more. When using Revelio on one of the walls that reveals another port key door, we walk through to see a very dark room. Here you just follow Fig until an indicator shown in game in which you press the square button which transport you to another room where you must solve an easy puzzle. Here you also learn the Lumos spell. This essentially is just a flashlight for wizards. It's useful in certain places and puzzles, but you'll find that the spell isn't used all that often in the grand scheme of things. As soon as we solve this puzzle, we must battle loads of knights made from rock. This is our first introduction to combat in the game. I will eventually talk about this more in depth, but as for right now, I won't speak on it since most of the spells we just haven't learned yet. After everything, we and Professor Fig reach a pensive. A pensive is just a bowl of water which you dunk your head in to reveal memories from the person that left it behind. In this pensive, we see certain wizards talk about hiding the port key that we just used. These wizards are Rookwood and Rackham, important wizards in which will come into play way later in the story. But for now, all that is known is that these guys are hiding traces of ancient magic that only Rackham can see. I think actually all of them can see it, but it's only specified explicitly that Rackham can, but I digress. They're leaving this trail for an unknown reason. It is up to the player to figure that out. This brings a story mostly tied to mystery, which is the type of story which I like the most. So in my eyes, this plot point is a good thing. 
After witnessing the memories, the main baddie, Ranrock, comes and greets us. He says that if we just give him what we found in the vault, he will let us be. But of course, we don't do that. And all of a sudden, a huge ass stone knight attacks Ranrock. This gives us the time to go through the portal and escape. And lucky enough, this portal leads directly to Hogwarts. This essentially is the start of your journey in the game and is the introduction of the opening title screen that goes on for a little too long in my opinion. And also during this time, there was an extreme amount of pop in happening with the actual structure of Hogwarts. It isn't super egregious, but it is super noticeable. Enough to where you'll stop and say, did that just happen? Regardless, this is when we get sorted into your house. The sorting hat will ask you like, two extremely vague questions, and from those two questions the sorting hat will pick your house. Even though I am a Hufflepuff, that hat sorted me into Slytherin. I pretty much just said fuck it and went with Slytherin. I thought it would be a little more fun, so why not? Keep in mind, you have the final decision in which house you want to be in. There is no difference in which house you pick in all honesty, it, it's just the common room that you'll be in as well as like one quest that will change depending on the house. So that takes away a lot of replayability when it comes to the game and I wish things could have been more different, you know? The Slytherin common room is cool, I guess. After looking at other common rooms, I, I think they're just miles better than Slytherin. I don't know if you guys agree. Maybe it's just because I've spent so much time in the common room to where I just got tired of it. Let me know in the comments what you think. While exploring your common room, you must meet three other students. For me, it was Sebastian Salo, Ominous Gaunt, and Imelda Reyes. Sebastian is your typical Slytherin with a huge curiosity aspect to him and a hunger for knowledge and power. He's snarky at points, but also extremely nice at others. He's the type of dude to scratch your back if you scratch his. I will also go more into depth with these side characters in their dedicated section later when these side stories become available. Ominous is a cool character that is blind and is a direct descendant of Salazar Slytherin, making him a pureblood. Though he doesn't believe in the traditions of his lineage, he doesn't think that the wizard kind should only be limited to purebloods. He believes everyone has the ability to become capable of magic. You start to understand that this dude's personality is nowhere near Slytherin's. The only reason he's in the house is because of his bloodline. You will also find this guy just wandering the halls with his wand showing him the way around Hogwarts. It is sick in all honesty, you can tell he's pretty powerful. Imelda is a snarky asshole who thinks she's the best at literally everything, essentially the school jock. Keep in mind, this character is only a small part of the game, she only holds quests that involve time trials with your broom, so because of that I won't go into more detail with her. She does have a small character growth, but it isn't enough to care about, you know. After making some friends, we meet with Professor Weasley. She gives us a field guide that is super important to gameplay. This field guide will also help you understand certain lore, help you level up your character, and spend skill points. Keep track of your map, quests, and everything else that is important to an RPG. Though there is a huge collectathon within the game that involves field guide pages, they aren't to the tedious degree of Ubisoft games. They did just the right amount here with the combination of exploration and going out of your way to collect things. They did a very good job in this department. Regardless, when we get to the end of our time with Professor Weasley, she asks us what exactly happened after the dragon attack, trying to get something out of us since she couldn't do so with Professor Fig. Here you have the option to tell her, or you can just lie to her. I chose to lie. I'm not entirely sure what happens when you tell her the truth, and from my experience there is only a few missions that have consequences to your actions with intuition. I think that telling her wouldn't change much. Maybe she would just dismiss you. Let me know in the comments what happens if you chose this other option. Since I didn't tell her, Professor Fig compliments us on evading her prying of what happened. This is pretty much it though. And with that, our next objectives are to attend defense against the Dark Arts class, as well as Charms class. While attending defense against the Dark Arts, we meet Professor Hecate. Hecate is an old coot who gives off the vibes of a grandma that nonstop cooks for their grandchild, which means she is dank as hell. This first class is when we learn the spell Levioso, the levitation charm. It is important to note that before you learn these spells, you must do this weird mini game of pressing buttons while simultaneously navigating the arrow with the analog sticks. I guess it is just a way to get the player involved with learning the spell, but they could have done this in better ways, or maybe just cut the mini game altogether. This spell is mostly used to stun your enemies for a short time, as well as to break shields that are glowing yellow. I think now is the perfect time to go into depth with combat. Combat in this game is extremely fun. 
through YouTube, you may think otherwise, that it may be slow, uninspiring, and bad looking. You couldn't be any more wrong. This combat has extreme depth to it and is so fun. Essentially, you have your basic cast that you press with the trigger button. This can either cause mild damage, keep a combo going, or keep an enemy stunned. The real bread and butter of this combat system is the actual spells that are color coded. Red is damage based, yellow is more so stun and subdue based, green is your unforgivable curses, your light blue is mostly utility spells that include stealth, light, repair, and your beast cure abilities that you will learn later. And finally purple. Purple is like yellow in terms of stunning enemies, but it also deals some damage as well. It is usually pushing enemies back, pulling them forward, and you can also use them in puzzles. The color of these spells is important because certain enemies will have shields around them in these colors. If that is the case, you have to use the corresponding spell color to break that shield and continue your combos. The system keeps you on your toes. You can't simply just spam things. You have to be methodical on what you cast and how you keep your combos going. To go further, you have your traditional parry and evade. Parrying at the right time will cast a spell that will stun an enemy even with the shield, which will allow you to continue a combo seamlessly. Evading is pretty typical. You just dodge out of the way from an incoming attack. In order to know which one to use, you have a yellow cue above your character's head. This is when you need to parry but you can also dodge as well. If it is red, then this is when it's an unblockable attack, meaning that you are required to evade. I can't tell you the amount of times where I just completely messed up and blocked rather than evaded when that red Q pops up. This also goes for breaking enemy shields. As you go forward in combat, you'll find that this combat isn't easy to understand. It may look easy, but it isn't. It will take about half of the game to fully understand what's going on and maybe a second playthrough of the game to fully master it. But keep in mind, this is only on normal difficulty. Hard mode may be a totally different beast. Later on, you will be able to add skills when you reach level five. This can include your dark arts spells, traditional spell casting, actual spells, room of requirements, stealth, and so forth. The skill system is not very in-depth but it is enough to where you won't get everything your first playthrough. You must actually pick and choose what is more important. This is something I like. You don't want to have a system where you feel extremely overpowered. You need something balanced and this does just that. The most important skill upgrade in my opinion was adding other spell diamonds, three to be exact. It lets the player have different loadouts in which you can switch to on the fly. When you have the number of spells as it does in the game, having these spell diamonds where you can switch seamlessly is necessary. Though it does take a lot to fully understand what buttons to push during combat to switch spell diamonds and get right back into combat with no issue, it is something I struggled with a lot. But to summarize, combat is amazing and in my opinion, it is the main draw to this game other than exploration itself. You'll find yourself going out of your way to engage with combat, to hone your skills, and to dabble in the dark arts. This combat system very much surprised me and how refined it is. Probably the best I've laid my hands on in recent years. Going back to the story while well, in class, Professor Hecate asks us to demonstrate using Levio so in the heat of dueling. In this case, we're going up against Sebastian. We then whoop his little sorry ass and knock him off the table. And afterwards, Sebastian is surprised and a little salty, of course, just like any other Slytherin. He then proceeds to stroke our ego surprisingly, saying that it was like dueling with an expert. Thanks, homie, I'm starting to like this guy. He then invites us to an exclusive, unsanctioned dueling organization headed up by a character named Lucan Brattleby. I won't get there because that is side quest, but it's pretty much just practicing your traditional combat against other students. It's not this huge thing, it's just a way to get you easily acclimated to combat going forward later in the game. But anyways, we go to Charm's class taught by Professor Ronin. Here we meet Natsai Onai, mostly referred to as Natty. Natty's a brave, extremely nice, focused, and stubborn character that's from Gryffindor. And like I said, we will go more into depth with these characters in the dedicated section. Professor Ronan is a character that I never really cared about, in all honesty. That kind of goes for most of the professors. They just aren't in enough missions to have you really care about these people. But going off first impressions, Ronan is one of those professors that seem a little crazy, but in a good way. He's outgoing, isn't an asshole, and seems to care deeply about what he's teaching. In this class, we learn an important spell called Accio. Accio is a spell that literally just pulls shit towards you, nothing simpler than that. But this section is more fun than the rest for a specific reason. We play a mini game. In this game, we must cast Accio and hold the button for a certain amount of time that allows the ball 
to get to the very end of the board for the maximum number of points. Here we go up against Natty, and dude, I got annihilated so fast. For some reason, I just could not understand how to use the spell until the very end of the game. And Natty kept getting a high points repeatedly. She embarrassed me, man. I love how they implemented teaching a spell while also teaching you a mini game. It just adds another layer of fun while learning a certain mechanic. And I wish more games did this. It kept things interesting. And after this, we meet with Professor Weasley again. The same type of question is asked where she pries into your business regarding what had happened before the Sorting Hat ceremony. You have the choice to once again lie to her or tell her the truth, and I lied another time. It just wouldn't make sense to immediately tell her what happened when you had just met her that day. Regardless, Professor Weasley says that she asked another professor to come up with extra assignments for us. Essentially, you just do certain objectives within the world, and when you complete them, you will learn a brand new spell. It gives a sense of progression for going out and exploring, battling and flying, and so forth. It gives a reason to do so, so to speak. You won't fully complete these extra assignments until way later in the game, so keep that in mind. These are technically side quests, so... But our next mission is to go to Hogsmeade for the first time and get our supplies all together. This includes a brand new wand, potions, herbs, and so forth. Also, you get to choose which character accompanies you to Hogsmeade. This can either be Natty or Sebastian, but I chose Natty because she gave off the best first impressions. When we got to Hogsmeade, the first thing I did was pick out my wands. After a pretty cool cutscene that deals with your character trying out wands and failing, you get to customize your own wand. I chose a warm brown elderwood type of wand that is 13 inches and unyielding building an emphasis on those 13 inches. I also chose a wand that has dragon heartstring. I thought it fit more in line with a Slytherin than anything else. I'm not entirely sure if this has an effect on your damage output. I'm leaning toward it doesn't, which is a shame. I wish they would have been upsides and downsides to which wand core you get. For example, you can have a dragon heartstring core that has powerful spells but takes longer to cast, or unicorn hair that is the opposite in which has low damage output but casts spells extremely fast. Then phoenix feather is a nice balance between the two. Though I would see the negative effects of this becoming prevalent, I still would have made players think more in depth about what kind of wand they want and what the effect of it would be. But after this, we go to the potion shop and purchase the recipe for the Endurus potions, which is a potion that makes the player invulnerable for a short period of time, and the Wiganweld potion that is essentially just the healing potion. We also get some Dittany seed. This seed is used to grow a Dittany plant that is used to make Wiganweld potions. Then lastly, we buy the spellcraft that allows us to make those said potions. After experiencing a tutorial on how to buy things from shops, a cutscene plays where a couple of trolls literally come out of nowhere and attack Hogsmeade. This dude is decked out in some weird glowing red armor which indicates that this thing may be controlled by something, but when the other troll comes, that is when we're introduced to our first real boss fight. This boss fight in particular isn't hard at all. As a matter of fact, most boss fights aren't hard in the game. I guess it really just depends on how leveled you are and what difficulty you're on. I played the entire game on normal, so that may be why things were too easy. So on my next playthrough, I am playing on hard and I will comment on this video what my experience was and kind of after doing the script and playing a little bit on hard I will say you should probably play on hard if you're experienced with RPGs. But this is also the moment when your character unlocks their ancient magic abilities. Essentially you just have to press both the right bumper and left bumper and it will initiate ancient magic if your meter is fully filled. Initiating your ancient magic is essentially a one-shot kill. This goes with Avada Kedavra when you unlock that spell. I found this to work well within gameplay when you're stuck in a tough spot within boss fights, but it can also be a cheese spell. There were certain times when fighting an important boss that when I initiated Avada Kedavra, I just cheesed the entire fight. Thankfully, this doesn't happen with ancient magic, but having the two feels like you were very overpowered most of the time. Like I said before though, maybe adjusting the difficulty would have fixed things. But also to add on to this, there is kind of like a an unlock within this, the skill tree where if you curse enemies throughout the battlefield and use Avada Kedavra on one other person, that Avada Kedavra would chain other enemies, which you can just annihilate an entire force of wizards or goblins in just a matter of seconds. So there is extreme cheese in that, and I just wished that wasn't the case. I mean, it may be mitigated because there is a cooldown on Avada Kedavra, and it's a pretty long cooldown, but I digress. But after the fight, Officer Singer, an Auror, comes up to us surprised that we took down a troll all by ourselves, but then just doesn't say anything more 
only asks us to clean up the rest of the village. Maybe you could have been more surprised that a brand new fifth year student took down a troll. Also, why is it that we have to clean up? Can't they help as well? This is more so video game logic, so I'll just forget about that entire critique. But afterwards, we just casually stroll into Augustus Hill's shop and buy some clothing. This is the most dramatic switch of events I've ever seen. One minute you beat some troll ass, and then the next you're shopping at Wizard Rue 21. I mean, if the story were to ever take player actions into account, this would be right on the money. Natty then makes the offer of wanting to go to the Three Broomsticks for a butterbeer. But on our way there, we witness Ranrock and a dude named Rookwood standing and chatting. They essentially just talk about how the distraction to get to us failed. I don't understand understand is why not just confront us? Why does there need to be a distraction? I mean, I guess you will have everyone's eyes on you, but so what? Take out the order and then take us after. I don't know, I guess I would have just done things differently, but this very thing happens when you go into the three broomsticks and meet with Serona, the owner. Rookwood finally has the bright idea to just engage with us directly, but since he's incredibly stupid, he does so in the middle of a bar filled with witches and wizards, and like I said before, it would have been so much better to just engage with us directly, either before the troll attack or on our way to Hogsmeade. That way you would have had less eyes on you, or maybe just at the least have enough backup to take everyone on. It just seems like an oversight to just further the plot. I understand that I'm overanalyzing this, but that is the point of this video, so tough shit. But after seeing this encounter, Nanny has some questions, and rightfully so. But our character says the classic hero line, I will promise to tell you everything later. <laughs> okay. Afterwards, we get back to Hogwarts and talk to Professor Fig. Apparently there is a map that is enchanted and it points to the restricted section of the library. This means stealthy time, but before that we must go to Professor Hecate and learn the spell Incendio, a fire spell that I relied on heavily. It does massive amounts of damage and it also helps against spider webs that are incredibly too abundant in this game. I do wish though that we learned the spell earlier, having it stuck in between knowing that something that is in the restricted section and then going to the restricted section disrupts the flow of narrative missions. Thankfully, learning other spells is something that you'll do on your own time. And speaking on that, I'm probably not going to go over learning spells again, um, just because of time and it would just take so long. When we meet with Professor Fig again after doing Professor Hecate's tasks, he states that it is now time to go to the restricted section, but of course, we get cock blocked. Professor Black comes strolling into the room, tells Fig that he wants to talk to him, then leaves. And keep in mind, Professor Black is literally only present in the intro, here, and at the end of the game. He was literally only put here to delay going to the restricted section and also like another mission after this, but it's not technically Professor Black. So my point still stands. Like, they did promotional material for this dude, but when he only has a couple lines of dialogue in the game... <sighs> oh my god. Thank god this delay only lasts a couple seconds. Our backup plan to talk to Sebastian since he stated before that he went to the restricted section, but when talking to him, he asks a question pertaining to the events that happened at the Three Broomsticks. You can once again lie and say that you have never met the man or you can tell the truth. And I lied obviously, though nothing changes again. I really don't think it matters what you choose. If that was the case, why put this decision here? But oh well. But when discussing going to the restricted section with Sebastian, he states that we will need to be quiet and not be caught by Peeves the poltergeist. Reason being is because he's a tattletale. This causes us to wait until it is safe to enter the library without anyone catching us. When the time comes, we get to learn the disillusionment charm which allows us to become somewhat invisible and stealth around prefects and professors. Stealth in this game can either be extremely finicky or extremely cheesy. There really is no in between. Either people will notice you right away or AI will be so stupid to the point where they just won't see you even though you're right in front of them. It is something that needs to be worked on, hopefully in future patches, but that is a long shot in all honesty. Though you are never stealthing much considering combat is just a more fun and viable option. So with that in mind, I guess it really doesn't matter. But after sneaking through the initial part of the library, Sebastian comes up with the idea of causing a distraction so we can get what we need. We pretty much continue to sneak around get interrupted by Peeves whose sole purpose is to rat you out like your younger sibling. This causes Sebastian to leave and try to find a way to make the situation better. As we keep going into the depths of the restricted section, we come across a secret hidden place within it. 
and using our ancient magic, we open a doorway and walk through it. These levels are what are known as trials. Although they don't look exactly the same, the color, ambience, and architecture are quite the same. In these places, as usual, you will battle these things called pensive sentries, the same ones that you battled at the beginning of the game, but eventually you get to a strange book that is above a pensive, and after grabbing that book and looking into the pensive, we see a flashback. I will say that this flashback is extremely hard to understand. Essentially, these four wizards make a certain place more thriving in terms of flora, making things more lively. While doing this, we see a girl who witnesses this event, meaning that she can see ancient magic as well. Flash forward, we also see her as a student at Hogwarts. Pretty much this scene goes over what I had just mentioned. You can assume that this woman will go full on, I have lots of power now, let's expand that. Your typical villain arc, it's extremely pretty predictable, but I will say it still had me semi-interested, but the story revolving around this character isn't the greatest thing that the writers were hoping for. Though when we get back to the restricted section, we see Sebastian getting confronted by the librarian. He essentially just took the fall for us, making him a certified homie and we need to do something for him in return. Not in the sense of in-game, it's just me talking morals. But after we get all of this information, we head directly to Professor Fig and tell him the news. He seems rather surprised that we handled the restricted section all by ourselves, and rightfully so, but the bad news is that someone has gotten to the book before us since a couple pages have been torn out. As you can see with the pages being torn out, the mystery is getting bigger and bigger, but the bad news is once you get deeper into the story, things just keep getting more and more predictable. Not to a staggering degree, but just enough to where you are only trotting along, barely paying attention to the story because you already know what is going to happen. Though I think this is something that is important to say now, Professor Fig really is only a character that you tell information to and nothing else. He doesn't accompany you much on missions besides like a few important ones, but that's it. You don't get deeper with him as a character, you only ever talk to him when you have sufficient information to advance the plot. And the only only thing he says consists of acting surprised and asking either sincere or rhetorical questions. It just sucks because his character is extremely likable with him being your mentor and all. During this conversation, of course, our character gives Professor Fig all of the important details, including the plot point of the student within the flashback, was starting as a fifth year student, just like our character. And let me go on for a second, I have a problem with this. Throughout this entire game, you being a fifth year student is talked about regularly among students, but you don't feel special at all mostly because this doesn't affect anything like your ancient magic does. It is only used to draw a connection between your character and the character that was in the flashback. It's cool that you have the exact same abilities as this other student, sure, but it isn't giving off the oh shit factor that the writers were hoping for. If I were to give constructive criticism, I would say add a lot more character interactions that express the surprise of a fifth year student exceeding expectations. But after this whole interaction, Fig is like, okay, now go to class and get good grades. <laughs> Like, okay, that brings us to herbology class taught by Professor Garlic. Garlic? Really? I mean, I guess it makes sense. And she's bad, bro, I'm not gonna lie. Here is when we learn how to grow plants and what they're used for. There's rather insignificant cutscene in a QTE where you have to take out a mandrake root. It screams and then you just repot it. This is only for cinematics. The actual herbology in this game is simpler than this. You get the actual tutorial with the Dittany seeds that we bought over in Hogsmeade. And when you do plant the plant, you have to wait for a certain amount of time. This can range from like five to 30 minutes depending on how big and important the plant is. In order to speed Speed up the process and get more out of it, you can purchase fertilizer. This system, though tedious because of the time you have to wait, it is still pretty fun. While we wait for the plant to grow, Professor Garlic tasks us with getting a plant from another room with another character. This plant is the Chomping Cabbage. You pretty much go to the objective, get the Chomping Cabbage, and then get a tutorial on how to use plants in combat. It's very easy, you just have to hold the left bumper, select the plant with the right stick, then tap the left bumper again to throw the plant out on the battlefield. The same thing goes for different potions. I mean, plants are helpful for sure, but I found myself almost never using them. I mostly used potions instead for defensive effects and heat of combat. You'd rather produce combos from spells since they're easier and, at least for me, more fun to engage with. Throwing your angry vegetables disrupts the flow of combat. Not to mention there is a delay between pressing the bumper button and the character initiating the animation. Bottom line is herbology is best used in combination with the production of potions. 
Using plants during combat is mostly just a secondary perk that you will find yourself not doing too often other than completing certain missions and challenges. But overall, going over Professor Garlic's character, she's alright, I guess. There isn't any character building with her. She is just a glorified NPC who just teaches you spells like any other professor in the game. I mean, I guess Weasley and Fig are different, but their actual narrative main narrative characters but you know what i mean going into potions we have professor sharp teaching us he just seems like a slightly nicer version of snape here you learn how to produce the wigan weld potion this is by far the most important potion that you learn in the game because it's a healing mechanic all it takes is some dittany leaves that you grow and some hork lump juice in which you find in the wild but after talking with sharp he has a task for you to go into his office grab some extra supplies and make an endurance potion this is your invulnerability potion there is an optional objective though. Gareth Weasley, Professor Weasley's nephew, asks you to grab a whooper feather in order for him to complete a special potion that he's been working on. And if you decide to give it to him, the cauldron will blow up in his face and fireworks will go off. And now we add the mallow sweet. And that's odd. What's happening? Wait, it's not supposed to. Ah! Get it! What happened? <laughs> well done, Gareth. I love it when games add these details. It makes you feel like you matter in the world. And when you do help Gareth and complete your potion, Sharp will confront you about it. And you're given the option to take responsibility for helping Gareth or just straight lie to the professor. If you tell the truth, Sharp will commend you. And if you lie, he'll be disappointed in you. There is no consequence to this. Unfortunately, it is purely a dialogue change. Wasted opportunity, in all honesty. Anyways, every so often during the game, you'll come across a message delivered to you. You'll hear that certain character speak and they will tell you to meet at a certain location. Natty did just this and when we meet her she asks if we can tell her what exactly is going on. And once again, I don't think that this decision has an impact on the story, so at this point, I thought it was right to tell her the truth since she seems like a cool person. But it sucks because after you tell Natty, she doesn't seem surprised, like at all. You literally tell her about ancient magic, which is like unknown to the wizard kind at this specific moment, and how Ranrock and Rookwood are after you, which is an important thing. These guys are extremely evil and very infamous, and they're coming after you. And all she says is, I guess I have more questions now. I'm not necessarily angry about the reply from Nanny. I'm just more disappointed because I know that the writers could have done something better here. Maybe Nanny just does not believe you at all and you need to explicitly show her to have this ability. Maybe you need to take her down to one of the pensive rooms or something of that nature to make the quest deeper. Regardless, Nanny is a homie and vows to help you find out the secrets behind Theophilus, Harlow, and Rookwood. And yeah, I forgot to mention Harlow. Harlow's in the game for like two minutes. It's only ever talked about and rarely shown. So by the end of the game, you're like, what the fuck? All this talk, all for what? But we're getting ahead of ourselves. After the conversation with Natty, we overhear a certain NPC that seems to be in distress. Come to find out, she's being confronted by some dark wizards. Here you just defend this certain NPC, no big deal, right? Well, this brings in a line of new mechanic in the game. After talking to this woman, she explains that Merlin has secret trials that need to be completed. These trials are little puzzles where after you solve them, more inventory slots open for gear storage. This brings a whole new issue within the game. Starting the game, you're only limited to storing a specific amount of gear. This amount isn't a lot at all. You'll constantly not be able to loot things within missions because of this. So in order to get the most out of the game, you really need to do these Merlin trials, mostly done before progressing any further in the game. But to make matters worse, some of these Merlin trials are locked behind certain spells. So if you haven't progressed through the game enough, you are semi-screwed until you learn these spells. One way to fix this issue would have been just to start out with more gear storage easy peasy. But after getting enough gear slots, these Merlin trials slowly start to become fun. It's just, it just takes some time. After our previous quest, we are tasked with picking up a few notes left by a house elf named Scrope. This sounds way too similar to another word I know. Anyways, this quest is the one quest that is tied within the house you chose. For Slytherin, you find Scrope. For Hufflepuff, you go to Azkaban. And I have no idea what the other houses do, if I'm honest. I just wish they had more quests like this that are decided based on what house you're aligned with. That way, you give people more of a reason to replay the game in different houses. Once again, a missed opportunity. For Slytherin, at least, we meet Scrope the house elf of the black family who has his ear cut off. Yeah, Scrope tells us that this is tradition for the black family to do so, and god damn, man. Regardless, Scrope has a proposition. 
We must help him with something only if he gets something in return. He helps us get the missing pages. We help him get a missing ring that is a black family heirloom important to him. It has to do with the crush that this house elf has, but that's besides the point. This is literally the only time you talk with Scrope in the entire game other than like toward the very end. Staying on track with the main narrative, regardless of which house you're in, the quest eventually converges on one character, Richard Jackdaw. Jackdaw is a ghost that died from having his head chopped off, and when asking about the ring that Scrope wanted, Jackdaw simply says that he pawned off the ring a long time ago, meaning that it is too late to find it, so poor Scrope. He only had a simple crush. The funny part is, Jackdaw was trying to do the same exact thing to the same person, but the woman wanted none of it, essentially just putting Jackdaw off. So even if Scrope got the ring, it wouldn't have meant a damn thing. After learning about the ring, Jackdaw says to meet him near the Forbidden Forest so he can show us where the missing pages are, so it seems legit I suppose. When we do eventually meet Jackdaw in the Forbidden Forest, we must follow him to a certain location where he kicked the bucket, which explains why he won't follow us after a certain point. I mean, shit, I would have PTSD as well. But as soon as we get there, we get ambushed by Ranrock loyalists, and of course, we absolutely obliterate them. It's not even a competition. And going into the place where Jackdaw died, this is pretty much a set piece of how glorious these dungeons are. I've never run into a dungeon that looked the exact same as the previous one. Every one of them looks handcrafted with care. This makes it so players have a reason to keep exploring. That literally is the draw to the game, as I've said previously. In these dungeons that pertain to ancient magic in the main narrative, you have puzzles that involve opening doors, puzzles that have to do with navigating that said dungeon, and so forth. All these puzzles have to do with spells that you know. And I love how they don't tell you specifically what spell to use. You have to figure it out yourself. That brings up the lack of hand holding through the game. It really is a breath of fresh air and reminds me of the time playing Witcher 3. Regardless trying to stay on topic without having the video go over 5 hours, we get to Richard Jackdaw's remains. You see this man impaled by swords with the pages scattered. This indicates that Jackdaw died from the knights that we are about to battle. It seems like he was trying to access the same place as us. It's not explicitly confirmed, but it is highly implied. But going further, we reach the main sanctum that we will visit throughout the entirety of the game. In this case, this is when you first talk to Professor Rackham. Here's your traditional exposition dump about what ancient magic is, what all of it means, who this professor is, and so forth. This is what I kind of hate about these moments when you visit the sanctum. It never ends up being this satisfying conversation. It is always exposition after exposition. It isn't the end of the world, but it is something that bothered me tremendously. The important part is when Rackham mentions that we need the book to place on the pedestal in order to reveal the full power of the sanctum. But the next order of business is to go to flying class? This is what I don't understand about the game. One mission you do something incredibly mysterious that you want to know more about, but the quest that happens right after has nothing to do with the mystery. It's like a bait and switch. I just wish the line of quests were more streamlined rather than all over the place. At least flying class is fun and is a huge beautiful set please. So in conclusion, I ain't gonna complain. Though it is important to mention that sometimes when you have main quests, you can do one or the other because you're presented with more than one. So it really is on the player to choose which one you want to do. But there also is times where you only have one and this was the case. So that's why I'm critiquing it. So here, Madam Kagawa is your professor teaching you how to ride your broom. At first, when on your broom, the controls feel a bit wonky. You ascend and descend with the right stick, but this is also the same stick you use to move forward. You use the left stick to position the direction in which you want to go. The left trigger is your limited boost, and your right trigger is standard acceleration. Keep in mind, the boost is infinite when closer to the ground, but is limited when you're higher in the air. And I have no idea why that is the case, but you just have to roll with it and of course you can upgrade your broom when you buy your own but you must do a certain side quest in order to do this the side quest is quite fun and i'm not gonna lie it is the time trials i mentioned previously with imelda this mission with flying class mostly involves flying through hoops around hogwarts then after class a dude named everett will ask you if you want to fly around hogwarts longer you can either decline this or accept to go on a sightseeing adventure so of course i said yes the only real consequence to picking this option is Madame Kagawa being disappointed in you, but also glad that you're good at flying. Okay. But the fun of not following up on mysteries with the main narrative doesn't stop there. Next is unlocking the room of requirement, which in all honesty, I love kind of the same outcome as flying class. Yeah, I wish I could continue the main quest adventure, but learning about these different systems is fun all in the same but still they do have a pacing issue in way of structuring these missions. 
So yeah. Here you essentially learn a spell that makes things disappear. You walk through this maze until you meet a house elf named Deke. Essentially Deke tells us that the room of acquirement isn't something you can just look on the map and only appears to someone in need, but lucky for us, we need it. Eventually the room transforms to what is as shown in the promotional material. Here in the room of requirement, you can brew your potions, plant your plants, decorate like you're playing The Sims 4, and of course you can take care of your beasts when you eventually get to that certain point. I'm not necessarily the best interior decorator, so if you see gameplay of my room of requirement being ugly, that is the reason. In this place, Deke will also give you some side quests, but we have a designated segment for side quests in a later video, so we'll just get to that when the time comes. And soon after we meet Professor Fig and tell him literally word for word what happened and tell him that we need to bring the book and the missing pages to the secret chamber. When the book is placed on the pedestal, the whole floor starts to change into an interactive map, so to speak. I think it would be cool if whenever you go down here in your free time and you have a waypoint active, it would show on the floor. Sadly, though that doesn't happen and is purely for aesthetic pain. What sucks though, is this entire conversation with Rackham is once again exposition on what the player must do. The four trials, Rookwood and Renrock's plans, and so forth. These are the kind of lines I wish I could skip, but I can't because I need the footage. Pretty much every time you see these keepers, it is constant exposition. I suppose some exposition is necessary, but they're extremely harsh with it. For example, some games hide exposition well, like The Witcher 3. Most of the exposition is told through optional dialogue and or told through character banter. Here it is forced upon you and blatant. Rackham is literally like, yeah, you need to complete the four trials. You have the rare ability that I'm going to tell you constantly every time we meet. Oh yeah, this character she did some weird stuff and i'm gonna tell you all about it even though you already saw it through the pensive like god damn i get it you want the character to be reminded but just dumb it down god the important thing to take away from this we have four trials that need to be completed in order and we can only do it alone so we meet Fig near a tower, take out some loyalists, investigate the said tower, and meet with Rackham who says the exact same thing he said to us at the map chamber. These trials that take place are very well designed with a bunch of puzzles that are somewhat challenging. They aren't exactly the toughest things to solve, but it does have your brain working. I guess the one positive about doing this alone is that companions won't shout out the solution to a puzzle. <coughs> God of War. Part of me does wish though that I should have changed the difficulty while playing. And I've said this before, I was playing on normal and I want to play on hard. After looking through this footage, I only died a handful of times throughout the entirety of the game. And it was on normal, like, like I just said. I would say if you plan on replaying this game, hard mode is what I recommend. And for this instance, when I was battling the huge statue knight, it was very easy. Like I got hurt a couple of times and had to use the potion or two, but I never died once when doing these trials. It's important to note after every trial, there is a pensive to be seen. So to make things easier on me, I'm going to briefly summarize the memory and then I'll give my thoughts on it. Essentially, a young woman named is Isadora and she was transfiguring the world around her, but is thinking deeply about the death of her brother. Her brother was sick, the exact same thing that happened to Sebastian's sister, which we will get into with his quest line. Isadora wants to take away her brother's pain using the newfound magic that she has. Yet, she is discouraged from doing so because Rackham explains that manipulating human emotion has consequences no one knows about. Some time passes and we see that Isadora has now become a professor at Hogwarts. You see, I understand what the writers are doing here, okay? Trying to draw parallels with Sebastian, trying to tell the player character that ancient magic is something that takes great care, blah, blah, blah. The biggest flaw is I don't care about Isadora. Isadora is long dead within the game and only appears within memories. I guess she's only here for the player to be shown the consequences of abused power in which you will see later. What I do like is the stakes being raised. You have Ranrock over here trying to gain a certain power that is most likely linked to Isadora. And as you will see soon, as we progress with the trials, the shit that Isidore does is worrisome. So if Ranrock had this power, it wouldn't be good. So I admit things are interesting, but there is no emotional connection with any of it. But I guess this is a game mostly catering to players wanting mystery rather than something emotional. And like I said, I like mystery stories, of course. It's just, I need something more in depth and then more you know, direct and more <laughs> captivating. <laughs> but when we get back to the map chamber, we meet Charles Rookwood. And this dude is related to the other Rookwood. Yes, we will get to that later. And the important thing to mention is similar to Merlin trials, we have these weird ancient magic trials. Essentially, when you come across these and complete them, your ancient magic meter will increase. Oh, the season changes to fall, the best season. And if you don't agree with me, 
you're wrong. During this season change, we get introduced to a new class, Beast Class. Here you just learn how to groom your beast, feed your beast, meet Poppy, and be a Sigma male and talk some shit to an animal abuser. Dude, I have no idea what was happening with the character model behind the dude, but her face was hella weird. But when we talk with Professor Howen, the Beast Class professor, she mentions a faction called the Poachers. You will encounter these guys all around the world and their name implies what they do. Usually when you come across these guys, there will be some animals you can save and take to the vivarium. It's so weird because sometimes you will just capture animals that are minding their own business without the poachers anywhere to be seen and you're told that you are saving them. Seems like we just took them against their will, but okay. Though this side activity is something that some players will have fun with, I never found myself to be drawn to it. I understand you can make some bank off selling these beasts, but it just wasn't for me. The inclusion of it within the game is a plus though. But after Beast Class, Poppy asks us if she can show us the surprise. The surprise is a literal hippogriff named Highwing. Not gonna lie, at this moment I was wondering where my pre-order bonus was, but here you have a QTE to show respect to Highwing. You also get some backstory with Highwing and Poppy. Pretty much Poppy found her with some poachers and saved her. Something noble for sure, but the real reason comes a little later. It does suck though that you can only access your pre-order bonus about halfway through the game. I understand it for narrative reasons of course, so I'll let it slide. We then soon meet with Sir Orion, again. We essentially ask about the goblin that was here during the troll attack, Lodgok. Ludgok is a friendly old goblin who used to have his reservation of wizard kind, but later grew to hate the loyalists that Ranrock was leading. Our job is to talk to Ludgok and see if he can help us against Ranrock. When we do talk to Ludgok, we find out that a witch stole a goblin relic and which is now kept in her sarcophagus, only accessible to wizard kind. And the reason that Ludgok wants it is to repair the relationship between him and Ranrock. This plot point of getting a certain item not for the purpose of being more powerful, but to mend a relationship is fascinating. All the time you see games have this item that holds immense power which could beat the bad guy this is such a little thing but it is something i'm going to compliment so there is this little puzzle in the dungeon right okay who can agree with me when i say it took a solid 10 minutes to figure this puzzle out it wasn't because it was hard it was because you just fucking couldn't see the other moth looking through the footage i felt so stupid because you can literally see it but for some reason, when I was playing the game, I couldn't. I even saw a TikTok the other day of someone having the exact same problem. I think the bottom line is these moth puzzles are kind of tedious. I want something more challenging. I don't want to play hide and seek with some butterflies. This is such an extreme nitpick, yeah. But now thinking about these moth puzzles, I just don't like them. Regardless, when we get to the end of the dungeon, it was all for nothing. The sarcophagus has been raided and a dead dark wizard was laying beside it. So this causes us to do another job for Lodgok. Simply put, we have to clear out a base of Ashwinders in order to get this helmet relic thing back. And when you do get the relic, it's literally just an item you pick up and bring back to Lodgok. I just wish we'd found it inside the cave from the mission we've done previously. This is an example of adding a mission that didn't need to be there in the first place for the simple addition of game time. I don't want to say it's an extreme negative, considering combat is really fun in this game. It's just the fact that you put a needless activity in order to progress the narrative when you really didn't have to. During this time is also when you learn the spell Alohomora. This spell is essentially the lock picking spell you learn from Gladwin Moon, the Hogwarts caretaker. Your objective here is to collect a statue that is only seen at night. Usually for these, you can just explore Hogwarts at night and take them. But for this mission, you have to stealth around and take it without being seen. The more you collect the statues, you will advance the lock picking level. Lots of locks in this game require level two or above, and you can find some pretty good loot behind these locked doors. But I'll admit, I really didn't dabble in lock picking much in this game, so I won't talk about this mechanic in great detail. But talking about the mechanic itself, I found the minigame to be quite fun. When reviews were dropping, a lot of people were saying that they hated this mechanic, but in my opinion, I think it's a lot better than what Bethesda does. And speaking about new mechanics that are being introduced, when we meet with Deke next, he gives us a knapsack in order to rescue animals. And I love this slow introduction to new mechanics. It makes it so you never get bored when progressing through the main narrative. Though because of this, storytelling dips happen like frequently, which can get annoying, and I've said this before, but I'm willing to live with it if we get to do more stuff in the world through these new mechanics. 
And just to talk about Deke for a bit, he is a really good character. He's extremely nice, loyal, will help you do anything, and honestly becomes a good friend throughout your time in the game. Avalanche didn't have to include full-blown quests with this guy, but they did. And one of these quests is him teaching you how to rescue animals and the mechanics behind it. And of course, you can just get the animal by simply using the knapsack like a spell. But for bigger beasts, you have to use a combination of like a spell that stuns enemies and then use the knapsack. It's pretty in-depth and took me a while to understand which spell is best suited for stunning these beasts. You also have limited inventory space for these creatures, so you can't just run out into the world willy-nilly and farm rare creatures. You have to think more in depth with it. And to release these characters, you have to release them into the vivarium within your room of requirements, and these are spaces specifically made for your beast. You have a total of four throughout the game. You get more and more as you do more quests with Deke, and while these animals are in your vivarium, you feed and brush them in order to get special ingredients for potions. Like I said, it's well thought out. And later on, you can get spellcrafts that automatically feed animals and brush them so you don't have to constantly go back to your vivarium and just do it manually. But let's say you run out of space in your vivarium. What can you do? Well, you can always sell the beast over in Hogsmeade, though I never sold my beast because I did get attached. That is still an option and you can get some serious bank off of it. This is very much for the people who like to role play in the game, having their own pets. I think it's well thought out. I mean, I've said this a lot, but it is well thought out in which you can reap lots of rewards if you consistently go back to the vivarium even for people who think they won't get involved with this mechanic trust me you will get sucked into it fast and i commend the developers for including this within the game even when they didn't have to but going forward with the main quest we get to astronomy class not to be confused with astrology as you can see with students when you first walk into the class here you meet professor shaw and to be honest i never talked to this professor again outside of this mission and to repeat myself the game really dropped the ball on getting a connection with your professors it is like you don't care about them at all besides Professor Fig and Weasley. You only go to these professors to learn spells and then just dip. And I guess it comes with the territory of it being an RPG, but The Witcher 3 taught us that not all RPGs have to fall into that trap. It's an opportunity wasted in my opinion, but regardless you meet a classmate named Amit, and I think I have mentioned Amit earlier. This dude is an academic overachiever, extremely scared of anything remotely dangerous, and is very friendly. This dude... He's okay, and if I were to rank this character, he would be extremely mid. You just never spend enough time with this dude. He's here for two missions, and for those two missions, he just talks about how scared he is of the danger that you're going to. But like I said, this dude's nice. He gives us his own previous telescope in order to participate in astronomy mini games, which in all honesty, I never did. Anyways, Amit tells us that there is a hidden astronomy table near Hogwarts and asks us to come with him in order to find hidden constellations. But this whole mission essentially was a big tutorial on how to read constellations within the game. You can clearly tell that near the middle of the game, the developers had a hard time trying to fit content within the narrative and have it be entertaining. It seems to be a bit of a lull, and I'm doing these main missions, but when I want to advance the narrative regarding the keepers, but it takes me a totally different direction so I can do menial tasks. Don't get me wrong, the mechanics involving the world combat and so forth are great, but I also want a decent narrative to go along with it, and right now I'm just not getting that. At this point we talked to Professor Fig and the rest of the keepers, and after giving Professor Fig all of the details regarding what had happened before our previous meeting, Charles Rookwood says that some unusual activity has been taking place at his castle, and of course, the bad Rookwood is stirring some things up, but this is also the place of our next trial. He tells us that there is some devastating power that is held within the castle, and it wouldn't be good if it was in the wrong hands, and I will say, I do like how they're adding some suspense to things that they really didn't need to add it to. The writers could have easily just said, yeah, the next trial is in my castle, go there and come back, but instead, they go a little bit deeper and give the player a reason to go there besides advancing the story. Like shit, I want to know what this devastating power is. What exactly is Charles Wilkwood talking about? This is an example of getting the player to ask good questions, an important thing in storytelling. An interesting thing that happens when we get to Rookwood's castle is when Fig tells us the alliance between Rookwood and Ranrock isn't a friendly one. I like this for a couple of reasons. For one, it adds some sort of intrigue when it comes to trying to understand what's going on. You want to understand why they don't like each other. You want to understand the different motivators behind each villain. We know what Ranrock's motivation is, but what about Rookwood? Is he doing this because he knows what his ancestor was hiding and wants to be a part of it? These questions are always good to ask. And two, it just makes the plot better overall. Having a partnership of villains with no conflict can be boring. It would just feel like they're one villain overall. Take a look at Halo. 
After the second game, the elites and humanity have an alliance because they have the same goal, taking out the Covenant. But their relationship is rocky, and this is shown in Halo 5. This makes things interesting. It builds the world around you, gives you a reason to care somewhat. And later in the scene, we see exactly why they have this alliance. Since Renrock needs to be under the Rookwood Castle, Renrock offered Rookwood some of his eventual power as payment. But this has them butting heads because each of their objectives seem to overlap with one another, which causes trouble. But after defeating some enemies and finally encountering Charles Rookwood, our character and Fig tell him the details surrounding why Ranrock and Rookwood are at the castle. But Charles literally just says, Oh no, this cannot be, and then just doesn't finish what he has to say. I understand he wants to have suspense for the player, but making it come across in that tone, it comes off as trollish and annoying. Now at this time, in this stage of the game, the trials are becoming more interesting. The portals that you typically go through are now part of puzzles. Depending on which direction you enter the said portal, things will change in the trial. This can mean disappearing objects, different level layouts, and so forth. I like how puzzles become a tad bit more difficult the further you go into the game, but with that said, they don't differ too much. So the difficulty spikes aren't drastic. And after defeating the boss and looking into the pensive, we see a memory of Charles. We see Isadora take literal pain out of her father and store it into a small cookie jar-like container. So now we understand a little bit more about which power Ranrock is after. The concept of pain being a magical power is interesting to me, and it makes sense that this power can be unpredictable considering it is a literal emotion. But I have some very small issues with this later. Regardless, when we get back to the map chamber, we meet with another keeper, Neem, Nam. Fitzgerald, her name is pronounced so weird, I just can't, I can't do it. Nothing is different about her. She acts the same as the other keepers. No need for delving deeper into her personality. She only states that we have to wait until our next trial, which brings us to the winter season. Now this is the time to meet with our good friend Amit. This quest entails going forth with what we were doing with Lodgok, since I don't think I mentioned it. Lodgok, when we last spoke, said that we needed someone who spoke Gobbledygook. And since Amit says he knows the language, we're here to try and persuade him into coming with us and meeting Lodgok. Persuade is probably not the right word to use. He just agrees to come, simply because we mentioned that Lodgok is a friend of Serona. What I think would have been great in this game would be a speech skill that you have to learn. It is in almost every RPG. That way you can have different outcomes with missions depending on what you had said to a certain character. In this case, if you didn't give a meet a good reason to come along with you, he would simply just not go. And this would cause a different ending either at the end of the quest or at the end of the game and maybe even both. It just feels like this game left so much on the table and when it comes to mechanics and skills, this game could have been so much better if they took the extra time to add speech options, different outcomes and endings, better relationships with NPCs and so forth. I understand that not all games need to do what The Witcher 3 does or what Skyrim does, but as a gamer who has come to expect these different gameplay systems within RPGs, it just feels like a huge piece is missing. But regardless, after talking to Amit, we make our way over to Lodgok, but he tells us some bad news. Apparently, when Lodgok gave the helmet to Ranrock, Ranrock had the intuition that a wizard had helped him retrieve it. This pretty much tells that Ranrock doesn't give a rat's ass about his own kind like he fronts. He just wants the power that the Keeper's locked away. And to me, this just seems like the villain is only bad and nothing else. He isn't compelling anymore. He has no good deed that he's trying to accomplish. At first, I thought he was just trying to get his power in order to keep goblin kind from being oppressed. But no, they don't do that. It sucks that this game hands you something very nice in terms of narrative storytelling, but minutes later they just throw shit at your face and see if it sticks. This is supposed to be a narrative RPG, and so far it's just an RPG with good gameplay. This game is very fun, don't get me wrong, but if I wanted to play an RPG that focuses on gameplay and mechanics over anything else, I'll just go play Fallout, Skyrim, Elden Ring, or Diablo. And keep in mind, I'm not really a Harry Potter fan, so the point I made is even greater for those in my boat. But going back to the story, Lodgok mentions an ancestor of Ranrock, Bragbor. Bragbor was a goblin metal worker who made these large repositories for a group of witches and wizards. One can assume that these repositories most likely hold the pain that Isidora pulled out of people. I wish there was a more curious nature to them, but that's what they're used for. And the group of witches and wizards are the keepers in which their names are in Bragbor's journals. Though, the conversation stops when the meat pulls up, and when he does, some funny dialogue plays where he tries to speak gobbledygook to Lodgok and fails miserably. At least, 
Amit can read the language, so he isn't good for nothing. And the reason we need Amit to at least read the language is because, in Longok's words, some careless loyalists may have left plans behind. So this whole mission is riding behind a coincidence of finding some plans that a goblin may or may not leave behind. Great. At least it somewhat makes sense given we're walking into a goblin base, but still. And when we both get deep enough into the mine after battling lots of goblins, we come across blueprints for enormous drills, bigger than the mine itself can contain. So we make it topside, tell Lodgok, and find out that this goblin actually knew Miriam, Professor Fig's wife. Apparently she was in Rookwood Castle studying something, but when she noticed Lodgok, she was extremely friendly, which is a surprise to most goblin kind. This caused Lodgok to be friendly and let her continue her research Research while he explored the rest of Rookwood Castle. Turns out that this small object that she was researching was the port key. This causes everything to come full circle, and I'll admit, this is the most interesting plot point that this game has displayed. A lot of the time, things are either predictable, disappointing, or mid. Being surprised of what Lodgok said was exciting to me, but this whole point is the reason why Lodgok doesn't align with a loyalist, even though he knows Ranrock well. He has seen the kindness in wizard kind. He understands that not all wizards can be evil. I don't know, I just really like how this quest played out. I'll give it a solid B+. This next mission is probably the most interesting regarding the main narrative. Here we find out that the next trial is hidden within the headmaster's office, and since Professor Black is full of himself, we will need to get into his office while he's away. This causes our character to talk to Professor Fig on how to get into his office. We pretty much have to get the password to make it through into his office, and the only other person that knows this password is no other than the Black family house elf, Scrope. Problem is, he most likely won't tell anyone the password. So Professor Fig offers us some polyjuice potion, which will literally turn us into Professor Black. While playing as Professor Black, you have all sorts of interesting interactions which are either hilarious or insightful. One of them is when Professor Sharp talks about a potion that Professor Black asked for to cure his boils. <laughs> Disgusting. You can also harass certain characters such as Gareth Weasley. I guess harass isn't the right word considering right after you do harass them, you're immediately nice to them. You can even encounter Professor Kagawa and talk about Quidditch and be a complete asshole and totally dismiss her. I had to bro, I had to say the reaction. And finally, when you talk with Scrope, it takes a fat minute to get the password out of him. It was a fitting given the mission. Eventually, when we do get the password, it is always pure, but in French. The Black family really are a bunch of dickheads, aren't they? It was just a weird pretext to a mission, and I was here for it, in all honesty. It was different, it was funny, and it gave us some extra time with the Headmaster, even though it really isn't the Headmaster. It was a good departure from the normal missions that you have been doing throughout the game. And regardless, when you are finally in the Headmaster's office, Neem tells us to read a book. And when we do, we get sucked in and teleported into the world within the book. Everything is literally page colored. It is super weird and different, but very confusing. You have to avoid minions and death itself while simultaneously collecting the Deathly Hollows. First, you get the Invisibility Cloak and then the Elder Wand and the Resurrection Stone to revive Neem's shadow. Everything within this later half of the quest is so convoluted with barely any explanation. For people that are Harry Potter fans, they probably get it, but for others, I can see them completely lost with what was going on here. They took this level in my eyes and missed the mark because they failed to inform the players well enough. But after fighting countless bosses and making it to the pensive, we see the memories of Neem along with Isadora. Here the two characters talk about containing the pain that Isadora takes out of people. Isadora also mentions that a certain goblin has been helping her, and we all know that this goblin is Bragbor. And after some arguing with the two characters, Isadora just takes the pain out of Neem and puts that pain within herself. But I have a question here. Shouldn't Isadora feel this pain? She literally just embraces this power and walks away. But if it is truly pain that she's putting within herself, why isn't she feeling that said pain? It just seems like a common sense thing to me, but I guess not. And this is a very small nitpick, so don't take it too seriously. But overall, this mission was amazing for one half and then fails, in my opinion, during the second, simply because they never explain what the hell was going on and why we're gathering the Deathly Hollows, why we're in this book in the first place. Hell, why is death itself here? I know it's connected to Neem in some way, but it's never explicitly stated. Like I said, everything is so convoluted. But then we meet San Bakar, the final keeper that we need to meet, and here you have a couple of dialogue options. You can say either Isidore's power was fascinating or disturbing, and of course I said it was disturbing, and my character also asked how she was able to harness this power. A simple and logical question to ask, 
right? Well, Bacard literally agrees with you, then does a full 180 and is like, I wonder that you were asking about her power. I won't reveal the next location to someone who doesn't understand the responsibility. Like, bitch, I just did three trials and whooped everyone's ass that was in my way, and you want to sit here and say I don't have the understanding? Don't get me wrong, sure, Bacard's statement is somewhat justified but his full perspective change after one sentence made no sense. We both agreed that Isidore's power was disturbing, so why did he switch and pretty much say we don't have the responsibility? We've just proven to him that this is disturbing. So why did... I don't, I'm getting too ahead of myself. Literally out of nowhere this just happens. I don't know, maybe it was a dialogue splice that was used for both answers that could have been chosen, but the developers favored a certain one. So here's when I'll go over the main relationship side quests. The main relationships are with Natty, Sebastian and Ominous, and Poppy. I guess you can count in a meet from Ravenclaw, but for this video we aren't going to include him. He's only in like two important quests. So, taking a page out of the Salt Factories book, an amazing YouTuber who does the same thing I do but with RPGs, after going through each character's quest, I'll rank them. I'm not sure if the Salt Factory came up with this system, but he is the person I got this from, so I'm giving him the credit for this idea. So starting off is Sebastian and Ominous. So the reason I'm combining these two characters is because the relationship side quests revolve around both. As I've said previously, Ominous is a blind dude that is a direct descendant of Salazar Slytherin, meaning his whole family most likely has been involved with Dark Magic. Magic. Sebastian is more of a curious, power-hungry, and dedicated person. He cares for his family deeply and will go to extreme lengths in order to keep them safe. The first mission that deals with the two is when we head to a secret location called the Undercroft. This place apparently isn't known to anyone besides Ominous and Sebastian, which is odd, why wouldn't professors know about this place? Regardless, this is essentially the hub for where you will find Ominous or Sebastian for quests. At least for the first time that the two of you talk, it's about the time when the both of you were in the restricted section. Essentially, the basis of these quests revolve around Sebastian's sick sister, Anne. These are the quests where you will learn the three unforgivable curses, and we're told that Ominous is the one who named this place the Undercroft, which means only us, Sebastian and Ominous, know of this place, and Sebastian urges us to keep it a secret. And going off of what I said earlier about Ominous, this dude comes from the lineage of Dark Wizards. He grew to hate his family as well as the unforgivable curses. You can already tell that this will come into play later in the quest line, solely because Sebastian mentioned it. But going back to Sebastian's sister, he tells us that he would like to have us meet her near Feldcroft. This feels way too rushed. We're a new student within a day of meeting this guy. He wants us to meet his sister. I guess it makes sense to a certain degree, maybe, but it just gives off the vibe of rushing a quest line, or at least trying their best to make you care about Sebastian and his family. The degree to which this works is decent, but I wish there was a little more time spent between you and Sebastian. And it even things out just a tad bit, since Sebastian asked, I tell the truth about what exactly happened before the sorting ceremony. About Gringotts, ancient magic, and so forth, Sebastian is at least more surprised than Natty, which is nice, though still the enthusiasm behind his voice sounds fake. What is interesting is Sebastian is rather more interested in the power you wield, rather than the things that you've been through, opposite of Natty. She cared mostly about your connection with Rookwood and Ranrock, so having these two characters care about different things is something that I should commend the writers for. Too many times do games have characters who care about the exact same thing, making characters less original and more like copies. The funniest thing about this quest is what happens afterwards. You just see Ominous right outside of the Undercroft yelling at you, and when you try to lie about how you got into the Undercroft, he just yells at you more. Ominous is a fucking asshole at first. He's like that one friend of your best friend that is way too overprotective and starts rumors about you for no reason. This dude even says that his father is friends with the headmaster and he will tattle on you if he needs to. Fuck this, homie. Take it up with your man Sebastian. He's the one that invited me down here. Following Sebastian's invitation to go meet his sister, we make our way to Feldcroft. Feldcroft is just a small village area, nothing crazy like Hogsmeade. Sebastian mentions that no one feels safe at Feldcroft because Ranrock and his loyalists have taken an interest in Rookwood Castle, and Sebastian believes that the goblins have something to do with his sister's sickness. Yeah, I think I forgot to mention that part about his sister. Yeah, she's cursed, which is why Sebastian is so hell-bent on helping her. And when we do go to visit his sister, it's like witnessing a friend argue with his parents when you're having a sleepover. Sebastian is doing what he can to help Anne, but his Uncle Solomon's a huge asshole. He has a pessimistic viewpoint on things. He doesn't think anyone can help Anne at this point. But just out of nowhere, she starts belting out screams of pain. Now, I'm not gonna lie, it was extremely awkward. The shitty part about this whole thing is you never understand why Solomon's being a dick here. You really don't get an explanation 
explanation, you just have to accept that this dude is an asshole. Like, where's the depth? Sure, you can argue that having a cursed niece can make you an asshole, but I don't buy that. Not in storytelling, at least. And to make things worse, even when you confront Solomon and say that maybe he just hasn't found a cure yet, because there must be something, right? He goes from being this understanding guy at the beginning of the conversation to this dick who accuses you of being just like Sebastian. You can tell that the writers were trying to paint this guy as the villain in this story arc, and it just doesn't work in the slightest. It just comes off like Solomon doesn't want to do anything and is lazy as fuck. That's all it seems like. At least when you talk to Anne, she admits that Solomon's probably right, but she doesn't agree with his outbursts. I guess having Anne as the mediator between the two extremes of Solomon and Sebastian's a nice fit. Eventually, Sebastian takes us on a walk to a hilltop, followed by some combat with goblins. After he tells us that the day when Anne got cursed, fire was being stomped out by goblins nearby, and that curse soon followed. Pretty much in simple terms, he just brought us here to help him search for shit, specifically clues on why Anne was cursed. The clues indicate that the house you are searching is the same house that belonged to the girl that was in the pensive, Isadora. This very much makes this whole plot interesting, but how in the hell were they connected? Why was it Anne specifically? You have all these questions with very little answers. The sense of intrigue at this very moment is at an all-time high. While you search the ruined house, you find certain journal entries of Isadora that talk about a certain ability that helps people and so forth. But we eventually find a mirror-looking thing that can teleport to the Undercroft, meaning that Isadora has some sort of connection with this Undercroft. This has the player in Sebastian wanting to know why, and when you get to the Undercroft, you see a damaged portrait with certain elements from it missing, which means that we need to find them. So far, even though I ripped Solomon a new one, I am enjoying this questline so far. It's dark, mysterious, has detective elements, and it connects with the main narrative to a surprising level. What I don't like though is the fact that you are forced to accept that Solomon is being a complete asshole even though his niece is sick. As a parent or guardian, wouldn't you want to help in any way you can? Try to find some cure? Maybe that's the point, I suppose? Having Sebastian care more about Anne than Solomon? Regardless, I just find it kind of annoying. And speaking on that, when we meet with him next, we overhear a conversation where Sebastian wants a certain thing called the Scriptorium. But the only way to come into contact with it is to learn the ways of the Dark Arts. The most interesting thing though is that Ominous wants nothing to do with the Dark Arts, and I love how they did this switch of sorts. We have Sebastian who seems like a great person who wants to help his sister and get better in a noble cause, but he is willing to do these unforgivable curses in order to do so, whereas Ominous, who came from a lineage of bad people, chooses to be a better person and never touch these curses. And it's so interesting because Sebastian states that the first time Ominous ever had the option to cast the torture spell was when he was a child. His family cast it on Muggles as sport and wanted Ominous to do the same but since he hesitated, his parents cast it on him instead. The change of tone between the last quest to this one was a huge one, and I think I love it. Just the way it took stereotypes and flipped it, is something I can appreciate. Though there are times where Sebastian gets annoying as fuck, it is understandable given the circumstances. If your family member was dying, would you be willing to use the unforgivable curses to save them? And on Ominous's side, would you forgive him for being a dick considering what he's gone through? I guess that is the main theme to this relationship side content, a question of what would you do? But to even get close to the scriptorium, we must talk to Ominous since only his lineage knows where it's located. Ominous has an interesting story behind this though, he only knows about the location because his aunt told him. His aunt, I guess, thought the same way he did. It is nice to know that Ominous isn't the only gaunt that thinks the morals that Salazar Slytherin had were false. It brings a more realistic nature to it all. No family is going to hold the tradition of evil for that long without at least some good apples in the bunch. And I mentioned briefly, I was roleplaying a character that was a good noodle in the Slytherin house, and seeing another character with the same morality as mine was a surprise. I was expecting everyone in that house to be either power hungry or raging bitch. Ominous's aunt Noctua went in search of the scriptorium so she can find out if Salazar Slytherin had more to him than just being, well, him. Turns out she fucking died trying to find that out, but we'll get to that later. Though, since our character for some reason became an asshole, we manipulate that against him in order to find the location, okay? So while you traverse this dark ass cave, you have to solve puzzles by looking at symbols on the door and then putting those symbols into the device that has a snake on top. This puzzle's fine, but I wish it was a tad bit harder. Maybe hide the symbols in hard to reach places. Maybe if you get the puzzle wrong, it takes off more of your health than it already does. I think this goes for a lot of games though. A lot of them feel the need to make things easier than they should be. I want my brain to be stimulated in a deeper sense, not just something that can draw out the quest so I can enjoy it longer. Finally, when you make it to the end, you see a note on the ground and right beside it says Crucio. 
Right by the note, you see the bones of Noctua. She died in order to open the door to the scriptorium. You have to use Crucio. And since she went in alone, she had no one to use that spell on. But the thing is, couldn't she have done it on herself? I understand that it inflicts torture, but if it meant getting out of that cave shit, I would have done it on myself. Though my argument falls apart if it is impossible to cast a spell on yourself, someone fluent in the lore tell me in the comments. But since Ominous is so hesitant on wanting to cast the curse in order to get out of the dungeon, we have to learn it ourselves. So that is one unforgivable curse down. But since I'm a good person, I decided not to cast it on Sebastian. You have the option to either one, not learn the curse at all and have Sebastian cast it. Two, learn the spell and cast it on Sebastian. And three, which is the best option to learn the spell but have Sebastian cast it on you. Since he didn't snitch on me in the restricted section, it was the least I can do. And I liked how this mission included the two characters together. You can see that Ominous and Sebastian have a good connection with one another, even though they disagree on a lot of things. Ominous is very much willing to help Sebastian get his sister back, but if that cost is to use dark magic, he is very hesitant. The different moral compasses of each character really has you thinking. Would you really learn the curse to save someone, or would you not learn them and not be corrupted? When meeting with Sebastian again, we find out that Salazar Slytherin wanted to teach dark magic at Hogwarts for the sole purpose of having students prepare to use them as a last resort. Wow, I actually kind of side with Salazar Slytherin. I love how this game builds out lore within the world. I would have never known this if I'd never played the game. Regardless, Sebastian tells us that the scriptorium mentions some sort of relic that can reverse dark magic. Sebastian wants this to save Anne, but asks not to tell Ominous. Well, coincidentally, Ominous comes strolling in the room and overhears. Ominous becomes a raging asshole right after, explaining why these are the reasons why his parents died, as in Sebastian's. Oh my god, <laughs> chill out. In all honesty though, I, I love the drama between them, but it is a shame to spoil the rest of the plotline, kind of. Ominous stays like this the entire time with barely any character growth. It's like they gave Sebastian all the glory, but left Ominous in the dark. And it's a shame because I love Ominous more than I do Sebastian most of the time. Eventually, we get to the catacomb that houses the relic that Sebastian's after. In here, you battle spiders as usual. One of the coolest things about this quest is that in order to solve a puzzle, in order to open a door, you must gather bones and place them around the door. When I was first trying to figure out how to complete this puzzle, I was stuck and almost quit. And I just had the intuition to pick up the bones. This kind of puzzle is what I'm talking about. You need to have something that doesn't take common sense. You need something that is outside of the box. And I'm not saying do this every quest, but having it here and there will go a long way in having a quest become memorable. And when you complete the puzzle, you now have the option to learn the Imperious Curse, which places the victim under the caster's control, essentially making them a puppet. This is very useful during combat when you're heavily outnumbered. You have the option to either be a good noodle and not learn it, or be a Sigma male and learn it. You have that option throughout the entirety of the curse. Since I already learned Crucio, might as well learn the other one, you feel me? I love how they gave player choice here. Some people may want to play as a good student under Hufflepuff. Some want to be an evil Slytherin. It makes sense. But I do wish there were repercussions for using the spells. Whether that be professors getting you in trouble, maybe every time you cast it, it lowers your health, or maybe have a morality system where if you keep using it, your character will become more of a dick over time. That way more replayability would occur. The same problem happens in the next dialogue section, you either have the option to take the relic or leave it. It is obvious that this relic is dangerous considering the note left behind said a sacrifice is needed, so there should be some consequences for taking it, right? The problem is, I don't know if there is one. If you choose to leave the relic, I'm pretty sure that Sebastian just takes it anyway and the sequence following stays the same. And if I'm wrong, let me know. But even if the ending is different, the choice still has me thinking nothing will change. There's so many quests in this game that have this problem, so how am I supposed to know that this one will be different? Going that extra mile here would have been extremely beneficial for replayability, and I'm going to push that point constantly throughout this video because it is important. When you talk with Ominous, who followed us, the same thing happens. You either side with Sebastian or Ominous, but nothing changes. Siding with Ominous will just have him trust you and he lets you take the relic. If you side with Sebastian, you still take the relic. 
It's just, why put this option here if you're going to have the same outcome? Though, when we make it outside of the catacomb, Feldcroft is under attack by goblins. Anna's about to be offed by one, which causes Sebastian to use Imperio on the goblin. This plays into Salazar Slytherin's viewpoint on dark magic. If you use a spell in a dangerous situation, you, sh you should use it, and I agree with that, but Solomon doesn't. All this dude does is belittle Sebastian and threatens to tell the headmaster about the curse he used. This brings another case of a failed sense of choice. You can either side with Sebastian or Solomon. The outcomes are the same regardless. Solomon is still an asshole, and Sebastian still goes through with his plan to save Anne. I just wish we had dialogue options that delved into Solomon's backstory rather than having a false sense of choice. When we meet with Sebastian another time, we must storm a loyalist camp while also going through a cave fighting spiders, the typical combat variety you have come to expect in this game. You find another piece of the painting and another sort of base that Isadora made only accessible to people who can see traces of ancient magic. Nothing of narrative importance really happens in the cave though. The important stuff is when we come back to the Undercroft. He insists that we try to go after the loyalists again, cementing the fact that he hates goblins, specifically because he thinks they are the ones that cursed Anne. When our character tells him that we should wait and get some outside help from another goblin named Lodgok, he gets all angry and shit. This is what I don't like about Sebastian. He essentially is racist toward goblins. He is oblivious to the fact that not all goblins are under Ranrock's control. So when we present him with the option to talk with another goblin to get some insight on what to do next, he just freaks the fuck out. He's extremely ignorant, even if the proposition we told him could help Anne. So it begs the question, is Sebastian really trying to save his sister? Or is it more about revenge? And keep in mind, me not liking Sebastian at this moment is a good thing. I hope that makes sense. But when we meet again, Sebastian says that Solomon and Anne are moving out of Feldcroft, which makes Sebastian angry. He says that he figured if he activated the relic inside of the catacomb, it would end up working. This means Solomon can't know, and Ominous must be persuaded not to interfere. But what I don't like about this is just from that statement. We already know that both characters are going to be involved. I want to be surprised that these characters end up at a location. I totally understand why the characters would reiterate that only they should be involved and no one else, but when this is heard by the player, the player is going to not believe that those said characters won't be involved. It's a weird side effect of having this kind of conversation. I just wish they wouldn't have mentioned Solomon or Ominous at all. Just have them come into the story naturally. When we meet with Sebastian for a main story mission, this connects with the pensive that Professor Neem showed us, about how Neem felt unnerved how Isadora took pain out of someone and used it on herself. Sebastian connects with that heavily, so of course he tries to manipulate us by saying that the keepers are trying to play us like fools, and we need to ask more about it. It makes sense. Sebastian's desperate. He wants to help his sister at all costs. I don't know, I just like the direction the writers are taking Sebastian. And you have the option to side with him, or take the moral high ground and call him out on his bullshit. I chose to call him out, because like I said, although it makes sense given what he's been through, I don't think it's within his right to tell me what to do. Fuck that, homie. And once again, no matter the decision you make, the outcome stays the same. After this, Sebastian leads you through a camp of goblins as well as through a cave of some sort. After you fight all of them, Sebastian becomes a snarky prick after you confront him about putting you two in danger. This is so funny to me considering we just solo Ash Widener camps throughout the entire game without any thought behind it. And once again, when you talk about it, he is continuing to be passive aggressive. And after your character threatens to end the relationship, Sebastian goes, Wait, 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 I'm so sorry. My emotions, man, I'm battling demons. In all honesty, I think it would have been better if the relationship ended there. Then later we find out that Sebastian put himself in danger and is about to be killed, so we go and save him. I just don't like that this back and forth of Sebastian being mad at you, and then your character says something, and Sebastian immediately backtracks. And when we finally get to the last piece of the canvas and put it together, we see that Isadora had a goblin help her with containing the pain that she took away from other people, with goblin metal. And we know this, like I said, it's Bregbor. And when Sebastian sees this, he gets excited at the fact that he may be able to save Anne. Yet our character doesn't know how to do such a thing. Actually, we never do it in the game. Even when he asks us to talk to the keepers about the ability, I don't ever think we do. I think they just reiterate by saying that it's an unpredictable form of magic. It's just an example of having a plot point and never following up on it. At the final quest with Ominous and Sebastian, we stumble across Ominous and Anne. Sebastian had the bright idea of going into the catacomb alone to try and open the relic that we found earlier. This causes Anne to leave. Now I will say this final quest felt so rushed. One minute Sebastian says that we should talk to the keepers in order to learn the power Isidore had, but without hesitation, without waiting for us, he just tries to open the relic anyway. 
It all seems weirdly structured, especially since the main missions and Sebastian's relationship quests are mixed and it is sometimes hard to distinguish the two. They both talk about the same thing. It would have been better to separate the two completely with possibly different storylines. When we go further into the catacomb battling the undead, Ominous suddenly realizes that Anne has gone to get Solomon. And I love how all of the sudden this happens just out of the blue, but I guess I'll go along with it. Finally, we meet Sebastian, but before we can even stop him, wife beater over here decides to take the relic and destroy it, which causes Sebastian to throw a bitch fit. This is when my love for Sebastian starts to fade. It isn't the writing that's doing this, it's just Sebastian as a person. When his newfound power gets taken away from him, all of a sudden he just becomes a five-year-old and uses the excuse of, I was trying to save my sister. This is just another example of a character that was hungry for power, finally got it, and when it was taken away, he felt the need to lash out. Regardless, this causes a boss fight in which we just murk Solomon. After this fight is over, Sebastian uses Zavada Kadabra on Solomon killing him. Same thing again, he hides behind this facade of wanting to heal Anne, but he just wanted the power, at least in my eyes. There was no reason to kill Solomon, there was no reason to fight him. Sebastian was just scared that Solomon would tell the headmaster, and in all honesty, Solomon would have. Sebastian was going down a dark road. My respect for Sebastian now has dropped significantly because of his actions and because of the decision Sebastian made when Anne finally shows up, she essentially just says that she doesn't want to see him again. In Sebastian's quest to heal Anne, he instead lost her forever. It's kind of a beautiful tragedy. But the real reason why this quest is beautiful, you get to learn Avada Kedavra after. Keep in mind, you can of course not learn this spell if you don't want to, but I want as many spells as possible, so I learned it. And after this whole fiasco, you have the choice to either turn Sebastian in for using an unforgivable curse, or not to turn him in. Since I don't want to be a hypocrite, I didn't turn him in. I have no idea what happens when you turn him in. Maybe the same exact outcome happens. I wouldn't be surprised. It is also worth noting that it is revealed that Rookwood cursed Anne, not goblins. It was supposed to be this huge moment in the dialogue, but I just didn't care. The big moment has already passed when Solomon was killed. Overall, Sebastian and Ominous's side story was great. I liked how Ominous was this person who cared deeply for Sebastian underneath his asshole exterior. I love how Sebastian, during a moment of panic, killed Solomon because of his lust for power, not necessarily because he lost what could help Anne. And this case is backed up because he literally said, instead of using the relic, he can control it. What I don't like is the unfinished plot point of our character not asking the keepers about learning the power to take pain away. It just felt like something cast aside. I also don't like how his quest line is the most connected with the main narrative. It felt jumbled sometimes. They had to balance the narrative of Isidore and Anne. And like I understand the connection between Sebastian and Isidore being set up, but I would rather have it separated, but that's subjective. If I were to rank these two characters, I think I like Ominous over Sebastian. Not because of any writing hiccups, but mostly because of the personalities. Ominous cares very much about Sebastian. He tries his best to warn him in the outcomes of dark magic, that it isn't worth it, and in the end, Ominous is right. Not to mention, Ominous is completely different from his family. He's nice, caring, and wants what's best for those around him. He isn't power hungry, he isn't a prick for nothing. Sebastian just seems like a whiny kid, who of course has a good reason behind his actions, but his constant bad decisions his concerning attitude towards hunger for power, and him killing his own uncle, he even drove his own sister away. The good parts about him though is that he is an amazing friend who would take the fall for you in a heartbeat, which I can commend. So, Ominous, I rank 1. Sebastian, I rank 2. Natty's a transfer student from Wagadu, which is a wizarding school in Uganda. And the reason she transferred was because her mother, Professor Onai, got an offer to teach divination here at Hogwarts. At the beginning of the game, when you first learn the Accio spell, you can find out more about the wizarding world, specifically Wagadu. Apparently, Wagadu is the largest wizarding school in the world, and this school isn't even a castle like Hogwarts. Nandy explains that it is a place carved out of the side of a mountain. But, in Nanny's words, it seemed to be floating in midair. She even tells us that at her previous school, they never used wands. They mostly just used their own hands. I find everything about Nanny's past interesting. Her past, her knowledge of the wizarding world, and her willingness to befriend everyone. Though her past is interesting, at least at this part in the story, that is all that she offers. 
personality seems to just revolve around her previous school. And this same thing stems to when she accompanies you to Hogsmeade for the first time. She only talks about her surroundings and how she misses her homeland there. This was a perfect time to get to know her on a deeper level. The only real conflict we see in her is when she mentions her lack of independence from her mother. But this is a typical teenager attitude. That isn't original. At least with Sebastian, right when we first met him, we find out that he and his sister are close and it kills him to see his sister in pain. A real conflict. Natty's quest really starts around the midpoint of the story, specifically near a certain castle. Her narrative stems around Theophilus Harlow, one of the sub-villains in the game, and, and Theophilus, in all honesty, is one of the main problems with Natty's quests, but we will get to that eventually. The reason that Natty's out here in the first place is because she tailed Harlow in which he picked up a note that had the seal of Rookwood. And when she found this out, she notified us because for one, we are the perfect person to help her, and second, we need the note in order to have the proof to turn Harlow and Rookwood in. You know, I would say I have a problem with her just following Harlow to his hideout by herself, but we literally do the same thing, but with other people, so I'm not going to complain. But then when asking her why she cares so much about Harlow and Rookwood all of a sudden, she brings up her past again. She states that she knew men like him in Uganda. After completing the game, I know exactly what she means, in which I'll explain later, but the problem still stands. Her stresses come from Uganda in the wizarding school there. Other than that, she's almost a perfect person. I love learning about new things within the lore, don't get me wrong, it's just I don't want that to be the driving force behind the character's motivations. It was the same problem that happened in Mass Effect 1 with Liara. Her whole personality came from the fact that she was an Asari. Though in this game, it's not as egregious. And after sneaking around for a bit and doing puzzles, we encounter Harlow torturing a hippogriff. Highwing to be precise. And yes, Highwing is a beast you meet in Poppy's quest, we'll get there eventually. But this is how the rest of the quest goes. You explore the castle while sneaking around and taking out some guards. You loot a lot of shit, and eventually you find Highwing and one of his hippogriff friends chained up. You break the chains, get on Highwing, and fly away with Natty on the other hippogriff. Following this is just a huge set piece of you writing a hippogriff for the first time. The quest overall was fine. A lot of it was just learning about Harlow and how bad he is simply by just seeing him torture animals and learning just a tad bit more about Natty. Not enough to keep me engaged though. At this point, even though this is the first real quest with Natty, I just felt let down. With Sebastian's first quest, it was pretty good. You find the Undercroft and eventually get to Feldcroft and battle some goblins. You then learn an unforgivable curse and so forth. Here it's just, yeah, you get a hippogriff in mid-storytelling. To me at least, there was some favoritism when it came to sad characters. Sebastian got the most love considering they included the unforgivable curses within his storyline. Poppy, without getting too into depth since we still haven't gotten to her quests, you get to learn about the creatures within the Wizarding Worlds. Creatures such as centaurs, golden snidgets, and you also get some cool ass set pieces. Here's just learn about Wagadoo, find out more about an underdeveloped villain, and so forth. Regardless, when we meet with Natty again, she supposedly has evidence against Harlow. But the thing is, we need to talk to a fellow named Mr. Bickles. But when we confront his wife, we find out that the dude's dead that Harlow had often. We also find out that her son is missing and we must find him. This goes for a lot of the quests in the game. You must meet these random ass NPCs out of nowhere in order to progress a narrative. Like it happens out of nowhere. This isn't a bad thing per se, it can just be jarring at times. But the whole reason why we had to meet Mr. Bickle in the first place was because Nanny gave the evidence to Officer Singer. Which then Officer Singer said that Mr. Bickle had been doing the same thing. So technically this quest didn't just come out of thin air, but it begs the question, if Officer Singer has this evidence, why isn't she doing anything? You can even tell her this to her face later and she just dismisses you with no explanation. The least the developers could have done is have us talk to Officer Singer the same time as Natty. That way some interesting dialogue can play out and we can get some little exposition on why Singer isn't doing a damn thing. I don't like the fact that we must wait until later to ask this question. Then again, we learn more about Natty's past, but this time it is quite interesting. Natty can see Thestrals, which means she has witnessed death, same as our character. Character. She mentions that it happened when she was nine, and the death that she witnessed was the death of her father. She was with her father while her mother was away back in Uganda. This story is quite sad. We learn more about her father's death later, but at least with this exposition about her past, it was insightful. It gives us a look into what her mentality is like. Instead of being sad about her father's death, she instead found peace. She thinks those who have witnessed death deserve comfort, which is why she thinks Thestrals are beautiful creatures. And at this point, I was starting to love Natty's personality. She's the most approachable sidekick 
character. Well, maybe tied with Poppy. Natty's extremely friendly, understanding, thought-provoking, and so forth. The hard part is to keep this personality interesting. Sebastian side quest did a great job with this because he was a flawed character, but Natty isn't flawed, which I think is why I'm not enjoying her side quests as much as Sebastian's. But regardless, after following the trail that Archie left, which was Mrs. Bickle's son, we make it to a camp where he's being held. We must sneak through the camp, engage in some combat, and then finally unlock the cage in which he was being held. Which pretty much ends the mission. Like I said before, I wish you were able to come with Natty to engage in dialogue with Officer Singer, but we all don't get what we asked for, I guess. The next time we meet Natty is when she's talking to her mother. She sent us a letter asking us to accompany her when she does this since her mother isn't exactly thrilled that she's been in danger. That is extremely fair, in all honesty. When we engage in the conversation, Natty says, Your message said that a creature was spotted near Hogsmeade. That could have been anything in that exact tone. Oh, brother. Yeah, so it turns out that Natty can shapeshift into an animal, which is extremely cool, but that cool factor gets taken away when the surprise is ruined. The way she presented that statement to her mother sounded like a lie. Clear as day. I don't know if this was the voice actor's fault or the writer's fault, so I'm just gonna blame both. Regardless, it turns out that Officer Singer has been telling Professor Onai about our escapades recently. Literally a snitch. So, she doesn't do anything regarding Harlow, but has the time to tattle on us. I guess it's for the greater good since we're kids, but Jesus Christ, man. You're an auror. Do your job. It just feels like writers are doing what they can to put the morally right thing into the spotlight, but instead, they make Officer Singer out to be a villain. This can work for some stories, but it doesn't work here. It had me rolling my eyes. Going into some exposition, Natty is what's called as an animagus. An animagus is when someone can self-transfigure themselves, essentially a shapeshifter. Natty specifically turns into a gazelle. This magic is heavily discouraged from being practiced in Hogwarts because for one, no one at Hogwarts knows how to do so. In two, it can make Natty out to be a target for poachers. This transformation explains why she can tail Rookwin and Harlow so easily. Natty explains that animagi are a product of holding a mandrake leaf in one's mouth for a month. And then you place that leaf into a crystal vial that is imbued with moonlight, then adding your own hair. With these steps, it is implied that this is directly taught at Wagadu. Even Natty confirms this. I find this very interesting and has me wishing that they included something like this within Natty's quest. That way it has a thing that can rival that was offered in Sebastian's quest. Prying a little further, Natty says the reason her mother is so controlling is because she had foreseen tragedy in her gazelle form. This makes sense considering Professor Onai is the divination instructor, and this little quest gave some good insight into who exactly Natty is. And this time, her background was a much needed thing to know. It explains why she can follow Harlow and Rookwood so easily. It explains why her mother is always worried. Then again, I still wish there was more to offer. Maybe seeing Natty in her gazelle form? I think that would be pretty cool. Anyways, this brings us to gathering evidence in order to take Harlow down. In order to do this, we must get evidence from Agabus Filbert, Otto Dibble, and Mr. and Mrs. Rabe. These names, man. First, we meet Daisy Rabe. She mentions that she is a security guard at Gringotts. She remembers Harlow threatening her with a note saying that her husband would appreciate it if she acted quickly by helping them get into the vaults. But since she physically can't get them into the vaults, they have taken her husband. With this information, she gives us the note in order to present it to Officer Singer. The same thing happens with the other two people we talk to. With Otto, a Essentially, he's secretly engaged to his boss's daughter, and while he was writing a note to her, Harlow came in and asked to check on a non-existent order. When Otto came back, Harlow was reading the letter and blackmailed Otto. This blackmail involves stealing from the shop, and if Otto cooperated, Harlow wouldn't tell his boss. Otto also tells us if we by some chance encounter the letter that we should destroy it. Finally, with Agabus Filbert, we find out that Bickle wanted him to speak out against Harlow's violence against him. And since he didn't do that, that may be the reason why Mr. Bickle is dead. When you're given the choice to berate him for not speaking up, he becomes extremely selfish and says if he would have spoken up, he would have died just like Bickle did. Agabus also tells us that the reason Harlow came to his home was because Agabus spoke out against Rookwood. After Harlow found out, he came over and took away a prized gold-plated poetry book that was made for Agabus' dead wife. I take the selfish part away. <laughs> he spoke against them before and literally got his house raided, so yeah. But regardless, Agabus agrees to letting us tell Officer Singer the evidence. This whole mission structure was not very fun, at least for this first half. You run all over Hogsmeade, going from one person to the next. You get these uninteresting stories in which you will tell Officer Singer in the end. It feels like a checklist, and checklists in games are hard to get right. I don't think they ever go right. 
Once again, I need to compare these quests to Sebastian's. Sebastian's was full of cave exploring, learning new spells, battling countless enemies, and understanding Sebastian's emotions. This is nowhere close to that level of storytelling and mission structure. But regardless, when we try to find Natty at the dock, she isn't there. This makes us use Revelio to follow her footsteps, walk into a cellar and open a secret door, and battle an ass load of dark wizards until finally we get to Natty in a cell, as well as Mr. Rabe in the cell beside her. To keep this mission short, we find Rabe's wand and bring it to him so he can break out, while at the same time we we find the different evidence and chests that was told to us from the characters earlier in the mission. I mean, there isn't anything to speak of here. Nothing was special about it. I just don't like how they structured Natty's mission. It just seems so dead and without character. It is countless menial tasks mixed in with combat. You can say the same for most of this game's quests, but it isn't to the degree of Natty's relationship quests. The thing I can relate this to would probably be MMO quests. And it makes it all worse when you're confronted by Officer Singer and call her out on her shit, explaining that the authorities haven't done anything. And guess what she says? There's more to taking down the Ashwinders than simply storming in and hauling them off based on a few accusations. A few fucking accusations? Natty and Mr. Rabe were literally imprisoned. We have evidence to show you, not to mention that us whooping some Ashwinder ass seems to be working just fine. It just feels like the writers didn't put in their best effort here. Whether Officer Singer's refusal to help was intentional or not, it's still stupid that she berates you for calling her out. Plus this whole mission we're gathering evidence, literal evidence, and it ends up being all for nothing. God, I hate Natty's missions, man. Regardless when meeting with Natty soon after, she tells us what really happened with her father. Her mother was helping a neighbor who was ill while Natty and her father were running through the savanna. Natty was her actual self and her father was a shape-shifted giraffe. On their way home, they encountered some bandits who shot at the two. In order to save Natty, her father bowed his head and took the bullet. So she didn't have to. And because of this, Natty takes the blame for his death and wants to do everything in her power to make him proud. It's a valid goal. Learning about this backstory was great, don't get me wrong, but the same problem is before rises. The only mechanism that the writers are using for you to like Natty is her past. It's not about the hardships that she endures while on your adventures with her. It isn't the philosophies that she believes in, and which was never even said, which is another con. They simply only use her past as a tactic for you to like her as a character. I mean, she's fine, but she doesn't have enough compelling points for me to rank her above Sebastian or Ominous. This brings us to the final relationship side quest with Natty. Natty got a forged letter from Harlow that was supposed to be from Mrs. Bickle. The letter gives us the time and place to go to a certain location in order to take Harlow down. But since Harlow forged it, this, it will be an ambush, but regardless we still push forward knowing this. This causes us to run headfirst into battle and take out Harlow's men with ease. I swear it wasn't even funny, this stems to taking down Harlow himself. I just used Avada Kedavra right off the bat and one shot him. It, the spell's broken. But I guess the killing curse doesn't kill him. A cutscene plays where literally no one notices that Harlow is still alive. Harlow gets up and casts Crucio at us, but Natty jumps in to save us. This solidifies the vision that Professor Onai had about something horrible happening to Natty. But of course, Officer Singer finally comes to the rescue and takes Harlow away and Natty survives. What I don't understand is is we had Crucio cast on us by Sebastian and we didn't get crippled. It was more like a tickle, in all honesty. So why does Natty end up in a wheelchair? This is a blatant product of plot armor, but I'm, I'm not mad at it. It's whatever. But there is a lesson here that is heartwarming. If you remember when we talked to Natty about her father and she blamed herself for him protecting her, this whole thing is reversed when our character explains things to her. Natty says not to blame ourselves for what happened. Our character lets Natty know subtly what we mean. And when she realizes this, it is honestly a feel-good ending. Overall, there were some major downsides to Natty's questline. A lot of checklist quests. Harlow was an underdeveloped villain. Natty's whole personality is based on her past and other small things. She's a good person, don't get me wrong, but that doesn't make her interesting. And when it comes to storytelling, interesting characters make the best characters. And because of that, I'm going to have to rank Natty the lowest at three. Poppy is a charming, animal-loving, kind-hearted, and empathetic person. It all makes sense considering she's in Hufflepuff. Sometimes I wish I would have aligned myself with Hufflepuff, like I said before, because I'm the same as Poppy. Our real first quest with Poppy begins with talking about Horntail Hall and stopping the poachers from making any more currency selling animals that they captured. Poppy says that she overheard some poachers talking about the area that we're in right now, and if we investigate things further, it may give us some clues. But the coolest thing is when we run into some centaurs soon after. These guys are extremely protective of the forest that they inhabit and are worried about wizard kind visiting their homes. 
fair enough. I'd act the same way. To add on to that, they're aware of the poachers in the area and they think we're aligned with them. Yet, even though we reassure these centaurs that we aren't poachers, they still don't believe us. They let us pass through though. This interaction was amazing to me because I never knew these guys existed within the Harry Potter universe. Including these lore bits is always a welcome thing. It was very different from the exposition dumps that Natty gave us to expand the said lore. Here they show you. They have you encounter these creatures and every so often you'll learn more and more about them. Specifically towards the end of this quest line. It is so much better than the mid natty quest that I did. Though eventually, after fighting some bandits, finding evidence that has to do with goblin metal, and so forth, we make it to Horntail Hall. This quest was heavily shown in the promotional material before the game came out. Here we see two dragons fighting each other in a ring. This is probably the coolest thing I've seen in this game so far besides the first dragon attack at the beginning of the game. Here we do exactly what you would expect. You have to sneak around Horntail Hall and try not to get spotted. Though if you do, I don't think it matters, which is always a great thing. The recent game I've played before this forces you to stealth, and if you get caught, it'll fail the mission. That type of structure should be kept in the past. It just takes the fun factor away from something that is supposed to be fun. But one thing about this mission bothers me. Soon you see the poachers chain up a dragon and torture it for no reason. The bothering part is they never explain why they do this. Is it just to paint these dark wizards evil? Was it because that specific dragon lost? so it gets a beating, you get no answer whatsoever. If it was the first instance I mentioned, that is a horrible way to structure characters as villains. Being bad for no apparent reason is realistic for sure, but it doesn't make factions or characters interesting. It just seems like no real effort was put into why poachers are poachers. Are they doing it for currency? Okay, sick, but you can make currency in other means, so why are they resorting to poaching? This is the kind of stuff that needs to be addressed. If it was the second option, it would be an actual, logical, horrible thing, so I have no critiques on that. As we sneak around more, we find the egg of the dragon that is being tortured, so we do the logical thing, take it so the poachers don't have it, and this brings us to the main arena where we battle every single poacher. And of course, we annihilate them and free the dragon. The weirdest part though is during the cutscene, you see the poachers dealing blow after blow to the dragon, but Poppy and her character just stand there, doing nothing. It's such a small nitpick, but it bothered me when I was watching. Like, why aren't we doing anything? It's like a horror movie where they just trip on air for no fucking reason and then get off shortly after. Nobody likes those horror movie tropes. The same thing stems to characters who do nothing in the name of dramatization. But enough of overanalyzing. After the dragon burns the poachers to a crisp, our character burns a hole into the tent so the dragon can fly away. But when we both ran away, we realized that we still had the egg. Couldn't we have just sat the egg down before the dragon took off? That way, it could have picked up the egg? I mean, don't mind me, just using common sense here. But I get it, we need more quests with Poppy so keeping the egg was necessary. But our characters decide to hold on to the egg for now, which Poppy will contact us if she has any more leads on where this dragon might be. But when we do meet Poppy next, she suggests that the Goblin Silver is what controls the dragons in some way, hinting at the reason why the dragon attacked us during the intro of the game. But the good news is, the dragon that we set free didn't have a collar. Also, you can tell Poppy the real reason why Rookwood is after you, just like the other companions. I chose to tell her, nothing bad happens because of it, so why not? The next time we meet Poppy is in the town center of Hogsmeade. She pretty much tells us that she went back to the tent to track the dragon's movements to see where she may have headed off to. She concluded, since she didn't know that the poachers had her egg, the dragon must have been headed back to her nest to check on that said egg. This brings us to try and find the dragon to give her egg back. This quest wasn't very eventful if I'm being honest. There are no poachers coming after the dragon. Honestly, there's no danger other than trying to dodge the dragon's attacks. But even with that said, all you do is go cover to cover to try and avoid a fire. You don't attack. I think it would have been better if we encountered poachers trying to get control of the dragon again. The thing is massive, they would have had to have seen the dragon flying about, plus it makes sense for them to go back and find that dragon. It would have been a much more interesting mission if combat was involved. Regardless, when we get closer to the dragon calmly and drop off the egg, the dragon checks us out for a tad bit then flies away with the egg. But the interesting bit comes after. I guess the reason the poachers didn't come after the dragon, or us for that matter, was because they know something about Poppy that we don't know. But even then, if he did want to get back at Poppy, going after the dragon would still be a valid option. The writers tried to set up this aha moment, but failed. They didn't need to exclude the poachers in this mission. They could have done the aha moment and had an excellent combat mission. I don't understand why they think they can't do both. Anyways, after this moment, Poppy runs off and we go our separate ways until she contacts us again. And when we do meet Poppy again, I guess the poachers visited her grandmother because they thought Poppy sent the egg there. She mentions that her grandmother's fine now, but 
What? The story took a very weird turn that doesn't make as much sense. We got two sentences out of Poppy that have to deal with her grandmother, and now they make a huge plot point of it. I don't get it. Would it have been better and more logical if they found us and Poppy trying to get back to the dragon? I mean, I mentioned this before, it would work even more now. They made this story more complicated than it needs to be. There wasn't a reason to include Poppy's grandmother at all. But through Poppy's grandmother comes another huge plot point. I guess the poachers didn't want to leave empty-handed, so they took Poppy's grandmother's journal that deals with rare creatures. In that journal, it details a hiding place for golden snidgets, which are thought to be extinct. But we need help with this matter, so who do we turn to? The centaurs. This brings us to finally meeting the centaurs, that is, if they aren't angered from seeing us again, but they in fact are. Out of nowhere, we see centaurs surround us with bows aimed at us. I hope they know they're pointing weapons at children. Fucking assholes. Some dude named Elec, who is their leader of sorts, doesn't listen to reason when talking to Poppy, who is making her case that we only want centaur help. Though, some centaur named Dorn comes out of nowhere and is the voice of reason out of everyone. You can tell that this dude is well respected. Even though he isn't the leader of their tribe, he ends up dismissing the rest of the centaurs and listens to Poppy when she mentions that the golden snidgets are in danger. Dorn tells us to retrieve a special moonstone and place it at the hinge of the forest. And after some waiting, Poppy tells us that the moonstone we are looking for is in a cave. She figured this out by just reading some books in the library. I guess when in doubt, read some books? Could never be me. While in this cave, you do the typical things such as battle some spiders, do the damn moth puzzles, until eventually get to this beautiful area in which the moonstone is placed in a tree. And when we get to the henge where we place the moonstone, some cute little creatures come out and do a dance. The way they move illuminates a certain symbol that is important, but something more important happens after. We find out that Poppy is the daughter of a poacher family. This explains so much as to why she's fighting so hard against the poachers, and it also explains why the poachers were after her grandmother, although I still think this plot point is not needed. They could have easily made it so the poachers had a grudge after we took the dragon egg. This makes it so the poachers follow us everywhere we go. But then again, having Poppy be a child of poachers makes her backstory a lot more interesting and it gives her character, especially since she and her grandmother are the only people who didn't accept the poacher lifestyle. This also ties into how she met Highwing. Apparently one night she just had enough, so she freed Highwing, jumped on her back, and flew off and never looked back. She eventually found her grandmother and stayed with her, and ever since her parents never had the thought of coming to find her again. Poppy's story is very sad, but it sheds some light on why she's so protective of animals. It also explains why she's in Hufflepuff. But the next step is to show Dorn the Moonstone and see what to do with it next. After getting the Moonstone handled and returning to Doran, he tells us that the dance the Mooncalf creatures did marks the place where the Snidgets are hidden. He also states that he knows the place that was marked. And when we get to that specific place in order to access the temple, we must do a little puzzle. Now, this puzzle was extremely simple, but I made it so incredibly difficult. You align the symbols on the ground to the corresponding symbol that is on the entrance door. The way you do this, you must align the light beam that is illuminated by the stone in the center of the thing. The thing is, I had no idea that the center stone illuminated light, so I was stuck here for a solid 10 minutes, but I love this puzzle regardless. It was different, and made me think for a bit. Poppy didn't blurt out the answer until the very end when it was clear I was never going to figure it out. I wish more puzzles were like this in the game, instead of the stupid moth ones. And once you're through the door and explore for a while, you get ambushed by a load of poachers. How did they even come in here? They, they just teleported? If that's the case, why couldn't we do that? This happens a lot throughout the game and it's never explained you're required to accept it. I take it as video game logic. It irritates me a little bit, but not enough to be a critique. And after defeating the poachers, we finally get to the golden snidget eggs. Our objective now is to break the charm that surrounds them, and after we do so, the snidgets crack their eggs and breathe life. And with that, Dorn vows to protect the snidgets. And finally, at the very end, we have to talk with Poppy in which she says she's glad to have met us. So what do I think about Poppy's quest line? I loved it to a certain degree. I love the fact that we worked alongside centaurs. We saw a dragon and freed it from a fighting ring. We got closer to Poppy and became her first human friend. It was a feel-good story to have Poppy come out of her shell and show us the real her. The mission design was some of the best out of all the companion side quests. Seeing a literal dragon, bro. Everything was perfect. What fails is the story itself. What was the deal with Poppy's grandmother? I understand it's important to mention her considering that is Poppy's only real family, but making it a plot point that the poachers went to her grandmother's house, it would have been so much better to just have the poachers hunting us down. It would have been interesting. There would have been suspense and urgency. Also, the questline kind of felt shorter in comparison to everyone else. One second, I was freeing a dragon, and the next, we freed the golden snidgets from their curse. It isn't necessarily because there was less missions. It 
more so the fact that the narrative was going full speed, the pacing just wasn't there. But regardless, where do I rank Poppy? I think she's just under Sebastian and above Natty. But that gap between Natty and Poppy is pretty large. <laughs> she had tons more personality than Natty, but less intrigue and curiosity when it comes to Sebastian and Ominous. Sebastian and Ominous felt like homies. They felt like my ride or dies. Poppy feels like my little sister, and Natty feels like that one person in your friend group who you aren't very close to. Quickly going over the companion's side quests, I thought they were quite enjoyable. Of course, there were some bad apples in the bunch, but I think I enjoyed them more than I did the main story. Whenever I saw an icon for one of their missions, I immediately stopped what I was doing to go to them. There was a lot more passion that went into these missions, even though there were some instances where they could have done a lot better. If I were to critique one thing, it would be to add more quests to these characters. It just went by too fast. But regardless, these missions were a hell of a ride. So if you guys remember during Sebastian's questline, we were trying to find Lodgok because of course we told Sebastian that we were and Sebastian got mad. Well, this is the quest that corresponds with that. So with Sebastian's questline out of the way after I talked about it, it should be a seamless transition to go into this. So we battle through this cave trying to find Lodgok, battling troll bosses, goblins, and so forth. I will say that when heavy combat sequences take place, I'm always happy. This whole cave was a literal combat zone with little dialogue. I usually don't like this, but in this case, I very much liked it. It has an addiction to it kind of like gambling. When we eventually do confront Ranrock, Lodgok isn't too far behind since Rookwood found him and captured him. This scene is suspenseful, and I'm not gonna lie. Essentially, Lodgok gives Ranrock Bragbor's last journal. But keep in mind, Lodgok never wanted to give Ranrock the journal in the first place. He wanted to give it to us. But Ranrock, knowing Lodgok hid this from him, uses some magic and blasts him back, but the huge twist comes right after. Lodgok is Ranrock's brother, and I never saw this coming. Mostly because of a lot of goblins share the same facial features, name pronunciations, and so forth, so I just thought nothing of it. But it became clear because Lodgok, Ranrock, like, you know what I mean? It's just way too similar. But then Ranrock goes full apeshit and tells everyone he doesn't need them, including Rookwood, so this causes Ranrock to off his own brother, breaks the cave, and has Rookwood run off to wherever. This also has us running for our lives to find a way out of the cave. I love this quest. The, the twists, the over-exaggerated dialogue, the insane combat, everything was chef's kiss in my opinion. I don't want to say it was perfectly executed, but it was damn close. This was the only time throughout the game where I felt genuine surprise, and I must commend the writers for that. But regardless, we meet with the keepers and tell them all the news, and of course, they're extremely worried, so therefore, Bakar reveals the location of the last trial. Finally. But there is a catch. This trial would take an exceptional level of magical skill, as well as an ability to interact with beasts. To me, this sounds like a more difficult trial, well, we will see. And this trial isn't necessarily difficult, it's more of a spectacle. Both are badass, so I'm not complaining. And in order to find a way into the trial, we have to tame a beast known as a Graphorn, but it's just not any Graphorn, it is known as Lord of the Shore. And when we do so, we must bring him back to the trial door and see what happens. When we eventually do get to the location of Lord of the Shore, it ends up being a boss fight, and this boss fight isn't very easy, which in my opinion means it was perfectly balanced. This thing will constantly try to ram into you with a small window in which you can parry or dodge. It had me on my toes. I was curious to know what happens afterwards. And the sheer size of this boss made it badass. And when you defeat him, you're presented with an option when a scripted scene happens. You can either attack the charging beast or you can kneel in respect. And I of course chose to kneel. It just feels like a morally right choice. No matter what decision you make, I think it plays out the same way, which sucks, but you know how I feel about that. When you do kneel, the beast will stop in its tracks and give respect back to you, which allows you to mount the beast and go on a joyride, crashing into poacher barricades, attacking poachers themselves, and just sprinting through the cliff sides of the wizarding world. It was a great set piece, in all honesty, and I'll remember it for a long time. I recount myself yelling at the TV out of excitement, and I loved it. But there is a, a, a little problem with this mount you just never use it any other time. The, the best way to use this beast is to put it in your vivarium and just never use it as a mount. Because for one, you have a hippogriff, and two, you have a broom. And it is mathematically proven that the broom is faster than the mount, so that takes away the mount, and the mount can fly, so that takes away the beast. So why would you ever use the grab horn? It, 
I guess it's for like the cool factor, but like you can fly with a broom in a hippogriff. So what? Anyway, but you finally get to the gate of the next trial. The door will unlock and the beast will be put in your beast pouch thing. Finally, when we look into the pensive, we see that Isadora has sucked so much pain out of her father, it caused all of his emotions to vanish. Knowing this, Bakar quickly tells the other keepers so they can confront her. Oh, also, she has been doing this on kids. <laughs> who knew Harry Potter can have such a dark universe, but I have a question here and it's kind of like a critique on this. How did nobody else, including the professors, know that she was taking kids and taking pain out of them? Like nobody knew that. The kids never tattled, never said one thing to anyone. <sighs> okay, I'm just gonna... Let's just move on. The keepers eventually confront Isadora. In this inner sanctum, we see that Isadora has created a sphere that holds all the pain that has been sucked out of people. And after some words are exchanged, a fight breaks out until eventually Bakar uses the killing curse on Isadora, which finally ends her horrible escapades. The big thing that I love about all of this was Isadora was never inherently evil, which brings me to why I don't like Ranrock. Ranrock hides behind this facade of wanting this power to help goblin kind, but he really doesn't want it. He just wants power. It's kind of the same with Sebastian. Case in point, him killing his own brother. If he cared about goblin kind, he wouldn't have done that. This makes him a boring character in my opinion. Other people may disagree saying that him killing his brother made things more interesting, but I disagree. Doing that just left a sour taste in my mouth. Killing someone close to you only to gain power for yourself is a cliche, but Isadora's different. She, in her mind, is doing the right thing by taking the pain from other people. She has just made the mistake by putting the pain within herself, making herself corrupt, which is my my interpretation. It is more original than how they handled Ranrock. It is a massive plus, but also a big letdown when it comes to the overall narrative. Regardless, this is why we have the Keepers. You can't simply destroy the pain that has been left behind. They had to safeguard it so no one could access the power that Isidore left behind. The Keepers wanted the responsibility to be passed down to someone else. Though the Keepers instruct us to create a wand that has only one use, and in order to do so, we must make our way to Ollivander's. Meanwhile, Fig will let the rest of the facility of Hogwarts know about the situation. But when we do get the wand, this is when I get a bit angry. You see, right after we get out of the shop and get confronted by Rookwood, which later on initiates a boss fight, it just feels like they shoved this guy in last second and said, well, we can't have this loose end, so why don't we just put in a random boss fight? I wanted something cool to happen before this boss fight, but no. We meet in Hogsmeade, of all places, after I get the wand. It was forced, and you can't convince me otherwise. Though the best part about this was when Rookwood says children should be seen and not heard. And the reason I like this is because it connects with Sebastian's quest line. Because like I said before, at the end of Sebastian's quest line, Rookwood's actually the one that cursed Anne. And that same phrase is what Sebastian heard. So anyways, back to the boss fight. This boss fight was not hard at all. If you get Rookwood's health to about three fourths and then use the killing curse, it's an easy W. I guess this was just a product of learning the three unforgivable curses, but when it comes to huge story bosses, they should have made it so those curses can't one-shot them. It's ridiculous in all honesty. So after doing all the trials, everything the keepers had asked, it is now finally time to see the huge ball of pain. <laughs> the map in the map chamber turns to liquid revealing a door, which is cool as fuck if I might add, but as soon as we open the door, things are already too late. Ranrock's forces are already here. This causes us to fight alongside Fig through countless waves of enemies, many bosses, and so forth. And since Fig is a homie, he brought all of the professors that we had met on our journey. Professor Weasley, Onai, Ronin, and countless others. This section is the literal definition of badassery and the right way to end the game. Everyone we had ever met is now going to help us end this threat. And oddly enough, it reminds me of the ending of God of War Ragnarok. And after battling through more waves of enemies, using the wand to have the huge guard stand down, and making our way into the sanctum where Isadora held the emotions she stripped, we're presented with a choice. We can tell Fig that we either intend to keep the sphere contained here, or we intend to open its power. I chose to keep the power contained. I wanted to play through where I was a good guy, so yeah. Also, this is the one choice where it does matter. I also chose to keep it secret forever. You can choose to keep it secret for only a tad bit, but here I'm not sure if it matters or not. It most likely does matter, but not to the degree of the first option. And I'm glad that at least they gave a sense of choice when it came to the ending and have it be fulfilling. Throughout the game, I was asking myself, would this game be better if it had branching storylines? I do believe it would, and it sucks we didn't get it. But at least there is a replayability knowing that there are more than one end 
ending, depending on the choices that you make here. Regardless, Renrock interrupts our conversation, and after it doesn't go anywhere, he fires a shot that gets placed at the goblin metal that was holding the power. Of course, the goblin metal breaks, and Renrock gets all the power and turns into a literal dragon. Okay, Avalanche, I see you. This boss fight's simple, yet very challenging. You can't just simply attack Renrock head on. You have to destroy these little color-coded bulbs that float around his body. You have to do this while at the same time dodging, parrying, and so forth. And I shit you not, you do this for about a solid 20 minutes, but it isn't a bad thing. I fully enjoyed this boss fight. It takes patience and skill to beat this boss, even on the normal difficulty. Most of the challenge comes from learning the attack patterns, and once you master that, you're going to be golden. And then, after, you finally defeat Ranrock, this beautiful, badass scene plays. So, as you can see, Fig passes away trying to help you save Hogwarts. I just find this death so beautiful. He asks for his wife's wand, he tells you that she would have loved you, and that the world could not be in a more capable hand. I don't want to say I cried, but just the journey we'd been on, helping countless people, meeting professors, learning new spells, fighting hard bosses, to have the main story finally end was sad, especially since your mentor died at trying to help you achieve your goals, who literally had your back the entire time. It feels like the grandpa you were close to passed away unexpectedly. Though the story hasn't been the greatest, I will say that this ending was well done. And after, Professor Black gives probably one of the worst speeches I have ever heard, and in all honesty, I wish he would have just never spoke after a tragic scene. It just feels like a cheap comedic relief, but it doesn't work at all. I found it annoying and it took some of the beautiful aspects away from the previous scene, but thank god Professor Weasley steps in and takes over. Professor Weasley does a decent speech, and in the end everyone raises a toast to the one and only Professor Fig. Also keep in mind there is an ending that has to do with the house cup, where if you do a lot of the majority of the side missions, level up enough, and collect enough pages in your book, then you win the house cup. I mean it isn't really like a huge thing, it's just literally you winning the house cup but here is a cutscene that kind of shows that ending this 
year, we have seen our students exemplify the bravery of Godric Gryffindor. Yeah. And now we can finish Woo. the loyalty Woo. of Helga Hufflepuff. Yeah. The wisdom of Rowena Ravenclaw. Hey. Mission of Salazar Slytherin. And so, the winner of this year's House Cup. Excuse me, Headmaster, if I may. One particular student's heroism during the attack on Hogwarts, not to mention the level to which they have excelled in their coursework as a new student, no less. Well, it would seem that it certainly merits, hmm, I'd say, 100 points to their house. Would you agree? Ah, yes. Thank you, Professor Weasley. I suppose we have our winner. And this is essentially the end of the main story. I loved some things and I hated others. I didn't like most of the villains in this game because they were one dimensional and not interesting. But I love the side characters such as Fig, Weasley, all the companions and so forth. I love the story revolving around Isadora, but I really didn't like how the keepers were handled. I wish instead of giving exposition dumps, they would contribute to the story in a meaningful way. And to put it in simple terms, the story was quite mid with a good intro, an average middle, and an amazing ending. The devs have it in them to create an amazing story, but it just comes with learning how to make RPGs. You aren't gonna have a masterpiece after the first one you make. It takes time and countless sequels. Though, when it comes to the gameplay department, they absolutely hit a home run. The exploration has meaning, the combat's extremely engaging and addictive with a learning curve. The other gameplay mechanics such as the room of requirement, mounts, and so forth are just the icing on the cake, even though the broom is the best mount mathematically proven, but I digress. For their first RPG, they made a damn good impression, so with that, is the end of the main story section. Overall, this game was a great ride. I got lost in the world, fighting poachers, getting closer to the companions that are in the game, flying a hippogriff, collecting animals to add to my collection, and learning new spells. This game has caused a new Harry Potter fan to appear. Hogwarts itself was filled to the brim with stuff to do, and outside, the same. Even more so than I was expecting. But with that comes some cons. The main narrative, although fun in some places, failed to keep you captivated. The story was uninteresting most of the time. There were some plot points points that didn't make sense, there were too many exposition dumps when it comes to the keepers, and the villains are all but lackluster. The developers and writers had it in them to create an amazing and captivating story. You see bright flashes of this, but most of the time it felt like they didn't give it their all, which sucks because when you see the environment inside and outside the castle, it's a completely different story. If they had equally given it their all to story, environment, and gameplay, this game would have been the game of the generation, hands down. But this brings me to the ratings. First is not even close. This is when the game is nowhere near a masterpiece. It has too many gameplay flaws, plot holes, uninteresting narrative, and overall was a messy experience. Next is it has potential. This is when the game shines bright in some areas, but most of the time it fails to deliver on its promises. Maybe a DLC or sequel can fix the issues. Second best is amazing. This is when the game is amazing, but because of a few gameplay glitches, questionable narrative choices, and off and on character development, this game isn't quite to the level of masterpiece. But that brings us to Masterpiece. This is when the game is nearly flawless, with an amazing story, captivating characters, breathtaking visuals and gameplay, a game that is worthy to be put in the Hall of Fame. So what is Hogwarts Legacy? The game is amazing. This is because the game excelled tremendously in the combat department, visuals, gameplay mechanics, and world design. The only questionable thing here is the story. 
The story was extremely mediocre. Most of the time I was either disappointed or I just wasn't interested. If I wasn't recording for this video, I would have most likely skipped through most of the dialogue. If this team decided to make a sequel, they really need to focus on the narrative department. And when they do that, no doubt will this be a game for the ages. But this brings me to how the rating would work for other people. See, the thing is, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you will rank this game most likely amazing or masterpiece. If you don't like Harry Potter at all, you're probably going to rate this. It has potential. I'm not going to say you'd rate it as not even close because the game has really good combat, environment, graphics, and so forth. And saying it's not even close would be just a disservice and you're just not being honest with yourself. But it has potential could be in that discussion. But let's say you are on the fence about the Harry Potter universe. It's literally a span of those three rankings, okay? If you're someone that doesn't look for story in a game, it's probably going to be amazing to masterpiece for you. If you're someone that is extremely extremely reliant on story to make a game great, this game is probably going to be it has potential. And pe for people like me that like to combine the two, it's going to be amazing. That's just how it's going to work if you are neither not a Harry Potter fan or a Harry Potter fan. It's just going to work like that. I'm sorry to tell you, but yeah. Regardless of the mediocre story though, I am so glad to have played this game and will continue to do so for a long time. But anyways, it's time for me to rest after writing nearly 50 pages of script. If you guys want to see a video where I break down most of the side quest, please let me know. Also, I'm starting to like critique my own videos, such as what to do next, how can I do better and stuff like that. I am seeing a lot of people within comment sections of these essay videos kind of critiquing the fact that a lot of them like to recap stories within games rather than critique or actually do an analysis. And I always find myself doing recaps instead of actually analyzing. So if you guys have have any sort of constructive criticism that would help me tremendously because I am gonna start leaning toward instead of recapping I'm gonna go over narrative like important narrative moments and so forth without going into excruciating detail that feels like you're just hearing an audiobook of the game so if you have any constructive criticism please just leave them in the comments below I'm gonna take them into heavy consideration and it's gonna influence my next videos otherwise I'll see you guys later please remember to hit that subscribe button click like and don't forget to follow the twitch the link is in the description below and i'll see everyone later peace out